All right. So we are, uh, we're in, we're live. How are you doing today? Uh, good, good. Just a, a little rush get again here. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, the LA traffic is a, is a nightmare, so I'm always super thankful when people can swing by. No, it's, it, it was really a hop, skip, and a jump getting over here. Uh, there was a little backup on Doheny, but uh, I was trying to rush to get a PSA uploaded for a client. So I was just doing a little extra work before I came in. That's nice. So look, um, you've had a massive like career in a lot of different things. Like you're a multidisciplinary producer, director, technical director. You've been in the business for like more than 20 years, 25 years. I mean, I would love to just kind of get into, you know, where you're from and how you got into this industry in this space. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I, I've been a workhorse. Yeah, man. Um, and I, I don't want to say that the first 15 years is a waste of time. Mm. But it's like I've really discovered that, you know, to make something of yourself, you got to go out and do it on your own. Yeah, man, that's so, the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like your, your setup here is, it look, it's awesome. Completely awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's been fun. I, um, when I came, so I ba I've basically been living abroad for 25 years. Okay. And, um, and I just thought that now that the actor strike is over and COVID is kind of in the rear view mirror, hopefully, um, that, uh, now would be a good time to kind of come back to North America and, and see what's what. Cause I think if you're a storyteller yeah. and you create stories in English, then you really have to be in the U S uh, no, 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 not at all. Not at all. You can create stories in any country, any language. Yeah. With you can uh you know, it's uh any American show is now being dubbed in a foreign language and foreign language shows are being dubbed in the US. Well that's true, so, yeah, that's, for sure. You see a lot of Korean shows on Netflix, which I, I don't have anymore, but it's like when I did have it, yeah. Because there was a big increase in that. And I think I'm not sure if the strike had anything to do with that, but there was a big push to have foreign content, meaning like European content, uh content from Asia, even like Bollywood's been a big um, th there's been a big supply of Bollywood movies. Yeah. Well, it's Amazon made a huge investment into India a while back. Yeah. And they've been actually doing, so Amazon Prime is huge in India uh, and they've been doing a lot of Indian productions. Cause I knew the guy, the guy who used to run, um, the f nonfiction productions here in the U S moved to Mumbai right before COVID. So we were in touch and then I think he's still there. Uh, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> So, um, so where are you from originally? Uh, I'm from Rochester, New York. Okay. Born and raised. Um, let me just move that in oh, closer there for you. Sorry. No worries. No worries. Have a drink, uh, relax. So, so Rochester, New York. So Xerox, Bosch alum. Yeah. Bosch not there anymore. Kodak had some issues. Just, uh, just some issues. I would, well, I was a still photographer for, um, for like more than a decade. Mm -hmm. And I used to work for the New York Times, Time, Newsweek, Fortune. I was covering China. Okay. Um, 2000, like two to 2012. And I remember doing my first r reporting from China using a film camera, using Kodak. And I did it, I even did a whole still book. Either. Still photography, yeah, yeah. And I even did a whole photography book, all Kodak, black and white, um, Kodak Triax. I mean, yeah, I mean, I loved film. I absolutely adored it. Right. Well, it's, you know, being from Rochester, I do have a lot of friends I don't want to say too much family, but it's like family in secular places inside the realm of Kodak. Hmm. Um, but uh, amazing! It's it, I don't know what's going on with Kodak. I don't want to, you know, yeah. not that I don't want to talk about it, but it's like I I love film. If I could shoot in film, I would. Um, I make independent films now, um, where the digital realm is so easy to operate all yourself without having to deal with chemicals, have things developed and then transfer it in or it, it's a big process. You know, it's like if I had more money or a bigger budget, I might be doing that. But you know, it's, it's essentially three, four main Hollywood directors that are keeping Kodak alive. Was it Tarantino, which he's doing his last film. Uh, Christopher Nolan, Christopher I think. Christopher Nolan. Yeah. And, uh, I think Spielberg likes shooting on film when he can, mm -hmm. but it's like, I'm not sure if he's completely locked into film. Uh, but there was a big handful of film directors. So during the Hollywood, during the um, Kodak party prior to the Oscars, the same big directors be invited. Um, not that I went, yeah. it's like, I hear. I wonder what, I wonder, I wonder what portion of a film budget 
like what percentage of an increase you have to tack on to a film budget to shoot it in film versus digital because obviously digital is faster easier quicker well, it depends on how much you shoot if you were like uh, uh kubrick doing 107 takes uh in the shining whatever it was you know it's like you're using up a lot of film mm. if you're di using digital it's it's memory that you can use over and over again but still you want to hang on to that digital uh imprint like uh, all my raw all my raw data I still have, even though I transfer it to another source and then transfer that to another source. I, I've got multiple copies of the same thing, so it doesn't get lost or corrupted or what have you. Storage is a huge problem, isn't it? I mean, I've done all these episodes of television, and I have like every frame I've ever shot on hard multiple hard drives all over the world. So it's yeah, it's, unless you have a, a great library system going back and trying to find some of that stuff is it's kind of hard. It's hard, yeah, <laughs> for sure. That's that's the understatement. Um, so Rochester, New York. So, I mean, um, where did you go to school, if you don't mind me asking? I went to uh, Monroe Community College. It's a small uh, community college in my town. Mm -hmm. um, you know, leaving high school, all I wanted uh, prior, when I was like 10 years old, I knew I wanted to come to Hollywood. I knew I wanted to make movies. Really? At 10? 10. Wow. What did, you, what did you see that sparked that? Or what did you know that kind of d drove you? I mean, did you play sports or anything like that? Uh, I was always into sports. Soccer, oh. volleyball. Uh, skiing, um, whatever sport is going on, yeah. tried to get involved. Yeah. Uh, but in high school, was, uh, I was on the volleyball team, the diving team, the ski club. I was part of everything. That's awesome. I think I can get my hands on. Yeah. Um, but it's like, I, I, this is where I knew I wanted to come. But guidance counselors couldn't tell me, you know, this is how you do it, this is what to do. So it's basically, I had to find my own. So it's like, when I left high school, it's like I had no real aspirations of what college I'm going to. So it was, it was like sort of like the last minute, I got to do something, I got to go somewhere. I'm like, all right, two-year school, I can get an associate's degree, I'll go there. It took me four, I'm looking at the dates, and it took me about four years to get through MCC, only because I traveled a lot. And every, when I was a, a sophomore, between my sophomore and junior year of high school, I went to Holland as an exchange student. Oh my God, that must have been fun. Yeah, so it, and even before that, I went to... Um, Portugal with my father. He was on a religious trip, and I was just tagging along just for the fun of it. Um, that being said, it got the the international traveling bug in me. Um, it was a great eye-opening experience traveling. Obviously, you traveled, so you understand it's a different world out there. It's a different time and place now than it was when I was traveling. Uh, but, I mean, it's like it was an experience. I think everybody should travel to it. Get out of the country, see what the rest of the world is. It's the only thing that you'll spend money on that will make you richer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so leading up to graduating high school, every summer and winter, I would go to Europe. Not every winter, but every summer, I would definitely go to Europe. I had my stops. I had Holland, where I'd visit the my Dutch host family that I, you know, host, host hosted me when I was there. Sure. I'd, uh, you know, one of the exchange students at my high school was from Sevilla. Oh, in Spain. Spain. Yeah. Didn't go there, but I called him up when I got to Spain. He's like. I'm in Madrid studying, but my girlfriend lives in Pamplona, and they have a little party going on. Meet me up there. That's all I knew. I didn't read Hemingway at that point. I didn't know. Pamplona, Spain, yeah. You got to run. Did you run with the Bulls? Every, well, as much as I could. I've run, I've run more than Hemingway. Wow. So you really run with the Bulls in Pamplona? Yeah. Yeah. That, I've got hit that's by one, dangerous. I got hit by one of the Bulls, but it wasn't one of the running Bulls. It was one of the cues. They, that, that's what I was told they were called, mm -hmm. is once they run the Bulls into the the Plaza del Toros, and corral them for the bullfights later that night. All the runners that made it into the bull stadium, you know, linger around. They release these smaller bulls. They have defects. Their horns might be broken or, like, they'll never be a bullfighting bull. So they let them run around and sort of chase the runners. Okay. I got hit by them. Oh, my God. Still dangerous. I had a, like, you can't see my thigh, but it's like a black and blue, black and blue bruise. Oh God. That sucks. Oh, my. That's amazing, though. I remember I was uh, like 21 or 22, and I went to Spain just as you know a fun little trip. And I was traveling with these two Danish guys, and we went to Pamplona. And um, obviously, we were in the wrong season for the bullfighting yeah. or for the for the running with the bulls. But we ran the whole route just by ourselves you without the bulls. You can't, and it's a long way. Like you can't run the whole thing with the bull run. The, the running of the bulls, you can't run the whole thing. Yeah, you either start at the beginning and make it halfway, hopefully, yeah. or you start halfway and make it to the bull. The Plaza del Toros. Oh my God! Yeah, it was it, it was it's a long haul, and Pamplona is very hilly. Yeah, yeah. 
And then I'm not sure if you knew about this, but many people don't. They corral the bulls at the mayor's house, right behind the mayor's house. There's a, a like a bull pen, but they keep the bulls in the barrio down below. So at midnight, they run the bulls from the barrio up to the bull pen uh, behind the mayor's house. You can't run with them. It's just the guy who's leading the bulls. But if you're lucky enough to find a spot, you're going to watch them run the bulls out. So yeah. it's like real fanatic. It's no little details. And because I knew somebody that lived there, gave me like some key, you know, things to look out for. I was an insider. That's like anybody coming along was like, wow, how do you know all this shit? That's like, just pick it up. So Wait, so I've been there like at least four years in a row. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So. And when did you finally read Hemingway? It was after that first year. Yeah. That first year. I love Hemingway's writing from Spain is amazing. Yeah. I always loved it. Hit that and like his African experiences in the Serengeti and stuff like that were beautiful too. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, okay. Wow. So you're going to college in the U.S. I, I love that though, that your guy. And I was a horrible student. <laughs> it's good. It's good. To, it's good I to admit that. That was a horrible. It's good to admit. Um, but so it's funny, like. At 10 years old, you knew you wanted to come out to Hollywood. You knew you wanted to make television or film. But but I find it so funny that nothing in your school or your guidance counselors could teach you, like, how to do that. Living in Rochester, the home of Kodak. Yeah. There's no film There's no film going on there. There might have been small production houses doing some stuff, but it's like no one could tell me, you know, who to contact, what to do. And it's like I, at that point I had no... I, not that I didn't have the initiative, but I didn't know, have the know-how to get in touch with anybody doing that stuff. All I knew was the television stations, and that's that's my background working in television. Right. So this would have been like 90s. So this is like pretty much before everything was online, uh, before it was super easy to find out like who works where and right. what was going on. So it's like it was at a time where it's like if there's an opening, they post it in, a, in the paper or you know magazine, and you could apply for it, and they were actually looking for people. Not like now where they post a job and they already know who they're going to hire. And they just have to legally post this to, you know. But, uh, you know, so it's like when I was a freshman with no experience whatsoever, I got a job at Channel 8, W, R, as a W, R O C, Channel 8 in Rochester mm -hmm. as a videographer. Really? With no experience no, like, as a freshman? Remember, they took me out on like two training days. Okay, this is what you do. I was like, all right. And it's like, I can do this. I can do this. And I, I always set myself up for failure, but, uh, yeah. um, you know, it's like, so it's like, uh, tell you some funny stories. Um, like first couple of days and when it's my lunch, I am driving around in the news van. They tell me where to go, shoot this, do that. My, my shooting skills were great. Okay. I, I knew how to shoot. A, I knew how to shoot. And was that from like, did you ever do a lot of still photography as a kid? Like what, 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 sh what gave you that kind of ability to compose? Well, from the age of 10, I was making uh, small independent films. Okay. With the local neighborhood kids. Um, on a Super 8 or something? Super 8 camera. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's in my high school or the, 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 the area of public school that I went to, there was a specialized school for trade. So you can learn how to weld, learn how to be a plumber, uh, cosmetology. They had a broadcast radio um, classification division. There. Yeah. So it's, I took that for two years. It was kind of a, I don't want to say it was, you know, the animals running the asylum, you know, it's like, but it's like we had hands on of some of the, I don't want to say state of the art equipment, but some pretty good equipment for what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I probably, I'm one of the few people that probably walked out of there with a resume tape. Hey, here's what I can do. That's probably how, what led me to, you know, get that job as a, as a freshman. It's like, I wasn't getting college credit because was working there. It was like, it was a job. Oh, that's amazing. Though. Yeah. So it was like, and so after I lost that, after I got the job, I, I signed up for, uh, what do you call it? Um, like it, 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 getting credit for, it wasn't an internship, but I was still, after I got the job, I went to one of the professors. I'm like, hey, I'm working in television. Can I get some kind of like credit for doing this? Like they gave me like an internship thing oh. uh, shortly after I was fired from, oh. there's, there's many things that led up to me being fired. So it's like, let me get into that. You know, they gave me a van. I'd go out and shoot stuff. Mm -hmm. I'd come back to the station, drop the van off, jump in my car, go to lunch, not knowing I'm supposed to take my lunch in this van. You know, it's like, keep it with me all the time, so I got all the equipment. So it's like, there's things I did. Uh, but so just in case they call you and like, oh, you got to go here, you're still like on call. So it's like, at the time, I'm carrying a beeper around. It's like, I never had a beeper before. 
I didn't know how to respond to it either. So, yeah. um, wow, beepers, that's a throwback. Yeah. So it was like <laughs> the only people that had beepers back in those days were cameramen and drug dealers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that's so that's wild. So, so you're making you're making small films with friends at school. No one at your school or any guidance counselor can tell you how to break into the industry. Then you go to a community college and take a film and television broadcast like program. Yeah, it was basically. I, I think the freshman year was uh, like ger- generic classes, you know, math, um, English, or literature, um, basic classes to get your your fundamentals down and see what you can do. And then you take electives, you know, next couple of years. But every there was a couple times where. You know, again, I didn't know where or what I was going to be doing, so I took a semester off to work down in Florida as a videographer. It's like some friends, there's a a college program where they were take some students from our school across the nation, but work in Disney World, so they'd be the summer interns at Disney World. Wow, that's hilarious! And it's like they went in the spring semester. I'm like, hey, I'll go down with you. And take me. I took the semester off, went down there, stayed with them a couple weeks. My hair was long at the time, so we had a house party on campus and security's waiting out the door because they see me because at the time you couldn't have hair up below your collar at disney world oh really yeah so they id they spotted me right away knew i didn't belong there so they waited for me to leave the house party and then probably kicked me off campus oh wow uh from there i went down to my grandparents house in uh, cape coral um still not knowing what i was going to do for that that spring got a job as a videographer for it was it was an ABC affiliate at the time, uh, WeView TV, W-E-B-U. Okay. Um, worked as a videographer down there covering accidents, um, fires, medical packages, and like just regular stuff. And I was like, because of my experience at Channel 8 in Rochester, I killed it at the station. And it's like summer came, and it's like I had the travel bug where it's like, yeah, I got to go to Europe again. Wow. So it's like awesome. I put the job there, flew to Europe. I think I came back with MCC for another semester, and um, by that winter, I think I went back to Finland. For the, oh no, it was uh, Sweden. I went to Sweden for the winter. I did some skiing there for you know a, a good time, and um, it's just a crazy, crazy experience. So you're like the most travel, well traveled American I've met. I think that's amazing. Uh, you know, it's 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 broadened my aspect of the world tremendously. Sure. Yeah, no, it's amazing. So walk me through. Walk me, okay, so I've seen, um, what was that Jake Gyllenhaal movie where he plays the camera, the cameraman driving around in the night, night stalker? The night, yeah. Yeah. So that's all I know about, like, a, a mobile news cameraman. But he basically would travel around and then wait for them to call and then go to wherever there was I, news I happening. Think, I think he was a freelancer trying to sell his videotape to the news. You're right. It was different. Yeah, yeah, it was different. Yeah. What do you call him? Like, a, not a spotter, but uh, there, there's a certain term. Yeah, like a paparazzi or or whatever. Yeah, yeah, freelance. As, and it, there was a real type of job. I I don't know how often it would happen in smaller markets, but it's possible if you got footage that you know a station would benefit off of. It would, yeah, that's amazing. So what? We, so okay. So you wake up at in the morning. You have breakfast. Uh, you drive to the studio. You pick up your studio van and your camera, and everything's in the van. No, no, you'd have to load it yourself. Okay, you unload it, and so you don't leave anything in a van. Uh, but I mean, it's, it was such a short time. So let me tell you, I lost my job at Channel 8 because uh, there was nothing going on. They had me inside for the newscast one time. They're like, all right, well, you jump on prompter. I'm like, I've never done prompter before. Yeah. Well, was like, like, and it was like the, the trawl, the, 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 what do you call it, the conveyor belt thing where you tape your scripts together. There's four blocks, four or five blocks. So A block, local news, B block, national news, C block, weather. D block of sports, and then, you know, like a five-minute, uh, you know, goodbye package, whatever, you know. Yeah. A block, fine. B block, fine. C block, fine. Get mm-hmm. the sports. We get into sports, and it's like, the guy starts reading the prompter, and then it's blank, and he keeps reading. So it's like, I don't know where the guy is because he was ad-libbing the video he was watching. I didn't know that, so I keep strolling. Yeah. Like, trolling, totally up on sports. Okay. So it's like, that's probably, that's, that's what led to my demise at Channel 8. But you were a cameraman. Like, how are you supposed to learn how to do it multiple doesn't things? doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, again, I, I was inexperienced at the time and um, it, it gained great experience shooting uh, sideline on 
at uh, high school football games or even college games. I'd be on the sidelines shooting the games. Um, accidents. Um, even um, they had me cut some kind of, there was a deer story going on in the middle of winter uh, where it's like getting towards winter. And they're like, had me go through the library and find all this deer footage. I can only find, it was a 30 second story. I can only find like 15 seconds of actual deer footage. And one of them is a deer bouncing around inside somebody's house. Oh Jesus. Yeah. So it's like, I had no footage. So it's like, what do you want me to do with 10, 10, 15 seconds of video they for a 30 second story? It's like, I didn't know, you know, didn't have no idea what to do. So it's like, not like I want to duplicate the video, but it's like, I had to come up with something. Um, super slow mo. Yeah. Was at the time, it's like the equipment wasn't either. I didn't know how to use the equipment like that, or it was like, uh, this is back in the early nineties where it's still rudimentary and it's like only cuts only. There's no, devol- no dissolves in my packages. So. Mm. And this is before, you know, like Getty images and yeah. image licensing and yeah. this stuff. I had nothing. I had nothing. Anyways, uh, Channel A was far behind, far behind. That's amazing though. It's such an interesting it's such an interesting kind of uh, beginning into the space. Like I, yeah. like I started off as a storyteller with writing and photography, and then, and then when Layman's Brothers hit in two thousand eight and nine, that really like flattened um, print print media. So then that's when I moved into television, like right. as a as a re- as a direct result of like not no longer being able to make a living writing and taking you know doing still photography. Yeah. After after living large for like a decade, yeah. it all just kind of flipped on its head and I was like, man, if I want to keep traveling and telling stories, I got to figure out how to like make, you know, use video cameras. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's um no matter how big or how well things are doing, every company sort of realizes that where to cut the fat after a while. Mhm. Um get back on a I heard a story like uh I'm going to butcher this, but uh, was it Entertainment Tonight or something like that where it's like the directors from the DGA who would be in there assisting with the editing, you know, they'd also be with a photographer on the red carpet, you know, shooting stuff. So if they used the, the footage from the red carpet shoot because they were the AD on that production or, the, you know, part of the Directors Guild associated with that production and they used it in a clip, they would get some kind of extra bonus money. It's like I again I, I I've heard stories about this where it's like people were just making money hand over fist if you know how to. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, it's they they sort of figured out who's using the footage over and over again of somebody on the right carpet where it's like you know somebody's getting money in their pocket for using that. It's like using Getty images, you have to pay for that image. So it's like it's almost like the GGA member had the rights to that footage, even though yeah. they didn't shoot it, they didn't edit it, but they were associated with it because they're DJ. And they were just yeah. they were just printing money on the royalties. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. That's a good business to be in. That's a good hack. And it's it's um, hearsay. It's hearsay. completely hearsay because I heard it from somebody else. And I'm I'm butchering the story completely. Yeah. Uh, but it's like it, there's ways to make money in the business. Yeah. Well, hearsay is what this podcast is all about, <laughs> and we're not we're not dealing in facts. That's for sure. Amazing. So um so after Florida, uh, after your stint uh, going back to Europe and then coming back to Florida, where where did you head next? Where did the career move after? Uh, with, with, let me jump back to Channel Eight. So I got fired from Channel Eight. So I still had this in- internship at MCC that I still had to complete because mm. I signed up for it. Now I didn't have the Channel Eight job. I got a job. I got an internship at the local cable network GRC. After I gra- graduated MCC and Brockport, that's my next school. Um, and I graduated Brockport. It's a four-year school because I had an associate. I only had to go two years. I graduated in three semesters. So it's like the drive was to get on the workforce at that point. It was like I jammed all my classes. I took 24 credit hours in a specific time frame to get all the required classes in. It's like, and and what was that? Just like just wanting to get into the into the working world, just start making money and. Uh, at that point, I just needed to get out of school. You know, th- th- it wasn't like a need to get out of school. It was just a need to, I want to get into the business. Yeah. That's all it was. And it's like, what I do is not work. I don't consider anything I do work. This is playtime for me. That's all I do is play in this industry. And it's like, I've had a, like you said, I've had a great career. Yeah. So, but uh, because I had the GRC thing as an internship after Channel 8, after I graduated Brockport, I got a fast job in a, the 179 market Utica as a director, technical director. And I was only there for a few months before GRC was going 24 hours. They wanted to be like the CNN of 
upstate New York. So it was like a 24 hour news station and they were hiring. So because my internship there, I was like one of the first people hired. So this, uh, so this local news station wanted to go to be like a 24 seven news channel. So they had to ramp up staff massively, I suppose. It wasn't massively, but it was like, there was a good handful of people. Hmm. So, um, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of remember the majority of news channels way back in the day, not being 24 seven, like not having just constant news on all the time, all the time, all the time. Like the news would come on at six. Yeah. Then maybe again at nine. Well, and then we, there was other programming. But, but the trick is, so it's like a lot of local news stations, like uh, technically I'm an employee of, uh, uh, KTLA right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like they have their morning news, which is a couple hours or, or just however long it is. Um, and then you come in and do the noon news, the five o'clock news, then the 10 o'clock news, whatever your shifts are. But this station would just constantly be making stories and just putting them on repeat. So there's a lot of repeat stories happening every hour. Yeah. So that's how it was a 24-hour news station. Of course, yeah, and just playing the same stuff again and again. And, and they didn't have any other programming, so... Oh, not bad. Yeah. So, so how did you, I mean, obviously we're sitting in my studio here in Los Angeles. Like when did you make the move to La La Land? Uh, shortly after G- I spent a year at GRC, mm-hmm. got a job in Buffalo at the Empire Sports Network at where I was the director, technical director, uh, where we covered Bills, Sabres, the, the NFL, NHL, and every other small, um, minor league or college team so it's like because i was a director i had to do the scheduling and i would assign myself as a photographer on a lot of these extra things that i wanted to do so i'd cover uh the bandits lacrosse games you know shooting it mm. um i'd be the one of the shooters with the buffalo bills games you know it's like you're in the middle of winter in buffalo outside freezing legendary cold yeah yeah but it's like you're operating camera and it's like i fucking love this yeah. i can't get enough of it i'd uh, my work style is I work. That's all I do. And it, to me, again, it's not work. It's all play. Mm-hmm. So it's moving here after Buffalo, after a year in Buffalo. Um, it yeah. just got too cold. I mean, a year in Buffalo, it's I'm like... From Rochester, it was no, cold as nothing. Yeah, but then L.A. It, it's, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a 60 degrees here, and people are like, oh, so I'm freezing. I'm like, are you kidding? Mm-hmm. I, I still get it. It's like, it's... I'm always too warm here. It's oh, really? Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, so I came from Dubai yeah. here, and Dubai was uh, is much hotter uh, during the day and even in the evening. Um, but I love how just cold it is here in the evening and the mornings. Yeah. It's so fr- so refreshing. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Um, so what made me move? And I, I want, if I can say anything to your audience. Say anything. I, I want to be, I want to be that asshole. I want to be that asshole. Where it's like, there was a guy I was working at GRC who was doing master control. Master control is not a hard job. No, I'm doing it right now. Yeah. So he moved out here because to go to school, but he got a job at Fox Sports as a cuts only editor, just doing highlights. He was making more as a cuts only editor, which is not a bad job, but then I was as a director, technical director in Buffalo, and that asshole. I'm like, if that asshole can do it, I can do it. So let me be that asshole. If I can do it, you can do it. That's and that's where that's where it went. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, listen, it's it's up to you to make a career mm-hmm. or to do anything. No one's gonna hand you anything in this life. So in, in this industry, it's even harder. Everybody wants to be in this industry. Agreed. So yeah. It's it just if you are there for fun, you don't think about it and just do what you can, you're gonna have a great career. Okay, so here's one for you. So like you're 10, 12 years old in Rochester, New York, making Super 8 videos with your friends, thinking about- Video, film. Film. Uh, thinking about, you know, going to going to Hollywood and making movies. How rewarding was your experience um, in upstate New York as a technical director doing all that sporting stuff when you really maybe wanted to craft narrative stories? Or were you, or were you like, could you have done another like 20 years just doing sports? Um, listen, I- Sports is a big part of my life. Sports is a huge part of my life. I love it. I get, if I'm playing, I love it. I'm mm-hmm. very, I'm not overly competitive, but I get competitive in the moment. Watching sports, I'm not too excited about. So it's like, that might be, you know, but it's like, I'm excited about what I can do and what I can capture at the moment. So it's like, if I'm shooting a game, that's great. It, 
going to watch a game as a audience member, yeah, you know, it's like this. There's a thrill of being there, but um, it, it's nothing like playing the game or being creative shooting the game. Yeah, it's a totally different mindset. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just one of my early jobs here. I was a, a a camera operator for the LA Dodgers Diamond Vision, so I'd be the guy going out to center field shooting the the uh, national anthem. So after the national anthem's done, unplug my camera, walk to my third base dugout location. And as you're walking across the field, all the players are out there tossing the balls, getting warmed up. It was like the Gladiator Arena. I'm walking across it. And it's like there was a feeling you've never, unless you're that athlete, and that's it's like it's a feeling. Mm-hmm. And it's like it's an amazing feeling. So every game, I, and that's what kept me at that job is like, oh, I get to do this. Yeah. And it's like, it's it's just every job you have, there's going to be a unique experience that makes it all worthwhile. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's sometimes I'd work for free coffee. But uh, So how long were you with the Dodgers for? Uh, two, three seasons. Was that a full-time job, though? No. No, it was a seasonal job. You know, it's uh, only for, what was it? They they have spring training. I was the chief photog, not the first year, but the second year um, that I worked for Diamond Vision uh, when they were in what do they call it? Not the Cactus League. It was the Grapefruit League in Florida. When they were in Florida, I think they're now in Arizona for spring training. But uh, I'd go out to Florida and shoot them. I'd go up and down the coast with the team. I flew back on the team's uh, flight. So it's like I got all these players. And it's like, it's, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. So that's that's wild. So you went from doing sports on the East Coast to coming out to L.A. and also yeah. staying in the sports game. Sports, if you're in television... You know, it's like there's like a progression. Like you start off doing news. Wherever you are, there's probably local news somewhere. But there's also somebody's covering the, you know, high school game, college game. If you're lucky, the, the professional games still have like openings to get in. So there's a progression to get into that style of work. I knew when I moved here, when I moved here, everybody wanted to be either a director or an actor. And I knew I could make a living as a technical director. And it's like I shot, you know, so at GRC when I was there, even as a director, technical director, I'd make an effort to, hey, this entertainment guy has to shoot some promos for uh, some movie marathon coming up. Oh, hey, can I help you? I got some ideas. So I do a, you know, put two plastic plates together, make flying saucers for the Ed Wood uh, marathon that's going to happen. And it's like I do a promo video with the entertainment guy. So it's like I was constantly trying to get on the camera, the shoot camera. Um, my skills as a technical director, I thought were, you know, I, I don't want to say outstanding, but I knew the switcher and I could make it do anything I wanted to. Um, moving to LA and becoming a technical director, I've gotten to know not all, but most, some of the best technical directors in town. Um, I would say by far Bob Ennis, it's the shout out to Bob. He's one of my instructors. When I first moved to town here, there was a new video switcher out that I didn't know. And I thought to make a good you know, run at a career here. I better get to know the new switcher. Took a course with the Grass Valley. Bob Ennis was my instructor. Bob Ennis was known for doing the Academy Awards for numerous years. Um, he has some, I'm not sure if he's patented on some of the uh, technology on the switchers, but he worked for Grass Valley and then Sony. Uh, he's got a, he's like the guru of video switchers. Um, having, and he was doing the Oscars. He was uh, switching the Oscars I, I can't tell you the years, but it's like he did it for a number of years. Mm. Uh, he later went on to switch uh, the, it, at the end. Uh, he was doing Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy as, I guess, his main job. Again, he's one of the better technical directors. But this is the guy who uh, I had him. I got a training opportunity at DirecTV one time, and he was the instructor. Sort of, It was another Grass Valley uh, switch we were working on. And it's like, he this is the kind of guy who could operate the switcher backwards. So you sit in front of the switcher, you hit the buttons. He'd be on the other side looking backwards and just hitting the buttons without hesitation, knowing what he was doing. This is the kind of guy he was. Mm-hmm. So it's like he had a video switcher in his basement he'd just play around with because that's he had fun doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, he would be able to create you know scene settings with no extra graphics outside the video switcher. I mean, it's like the, what you're cutting on now. Just imagine, you know, creating a, a scene with a road, hills, helicopter flying, car driving by, palm trees, waving in the wind, that he would be able to create this off a video switcher That's with amazing. no extra input whatsoever. Yeah. So he was an incredible guy. 
Um, and then, you know, there's a great handful of other guys I, I put in that same realm. But these are guys who know the video switchers inside and out. And they are, I don't want to say tech geeks, but they are. They know their, their shit on the switcher. Mm. Um, it's interesting, actually, because I've, I've spoken to a lot of people since I've been out here. And I've spoken to some directors and some actors. And they say, like, the thing that kills them the most is the downtime between projects, right? Because you don't always get to choose your project, and then you end up sitting around waiting for people to say yes or no a lot. So it you lose the power of, like, pushing your career forward. And a lot of people have been telling me, too, like, but if you come in on the technical side, or if you come in on the, um, on the services side, you know, you maybe lose a bit of the glamour of being the actor or the, you know, feature director, but at least you're working all the time mm -hmm. and you can make a living and you can control your life and your income and your, you, you know, have, you have some security, you have some knowledge that there's paychecks coming in. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, it, you know, it's throughout my time, I've been very lucky, very lucky, um, where it's, I have this, I have a saying there, there is an old saying. It's not what you know, it's who you know. In Hollywood, it's not that. It's not that at all. It's not what you know. It's not who you know. It's who knows you. Really? That's it. Because I I don't make phone calls. I tend not to make phone calls. I get phone calls all the time asking, you know, hey, can you come in? Can you do this? Can you do this? And that's that's been my career for the last 20 years, people calling me. Mm -hmm. Because you work with, a, you know, it's, you work a production and it goes well. You're going to be the first guy they call back. You work at production, everybody goes off their own ways. And when they work on a job where, oh, shit, somebody didn't show up or we need a technical director, you know anybody? Anybody know anybody that does it? Yeah, I know a guy. That's They pull your name. That's how I got at the NFL. So they, they had somebody come in who didn't know what the fuck they were doing. It was like, I was talking to the director later, and he's like, yeah, we, we had some guy who couldn't even dissolve. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's that's all Switcher did. Switcher does three things. Cuts dissolves and keys mm -hmm. so i even know how to fade to black on this guy there you go, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> um so it's i got called in because i had two friends over there ed ed wood ed, sorry ed field and mark woodward mm -hmm. um and they both suggested my name so i get a phone call i was like hey can you come in this is the nfl can you come in yeah i'll be right there is the nfl based in los angeles it was based in culver city now it's down at the inglewood next to the stadium okay so and uh, I'll hate, I hate to say, but the management's changed quite a bit since I started working there. Mm, I believe so. I'm sure. I'm sure you got some <laughs> stories, and I'm sure you signed some NDAs and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm biggest. My biggest fear is, I've signed a lot of NDAs, and I don't know what I could say and what I can't say. Yeah, that's that's always that's always that's always a little tough when you're dealing with the NFL. But no, it's it's great, and we can you know keep it light and keep it fun. I mean, when did you when did you decide to go back to your roots of like you know making those short films with your friends because I knew like that sounds like it was like really your passion and if yeah. and it sounds like sports was obviously a passion of yours as well and, and you were paying the bills and, and you were busy yeah. like when did you decide like oh I need to like go back and try to make a feature or or, or get back into narratives um um well, I'm here because you did you did the you did this immortal thieves yeah yeah like that's a big shout out. Yeah. Coming to a theater near you. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, that's, this is the first feature film I directed. This is my third feature. Um, and I just got the PGA mark for this one. So I received the PGA mark on two films, Bottle Monster and this film. So as a producer, PGA mark outside of the PGA doesn't really mean much for anything. And this is not the Professional Golf Association. No, it's, this is... and I find there's a lack of resolve at the Producers Guild of America. I, I, joke around with every everybody I run into at the PGA and they, they don't find that humor. No, it's like, where's Roy McElroy? Yep. So, have, having the PGA mark next to your name means that you worked on this film from the beginning, middle, and end. This film would not have been made without you. And it's it's it means a lot. And the fact that a lot of these independent film producers are not going for the mark it is they're leaving, they're leaving a, you know, they're walking away from the table with stuff still on it. How how do you how do you join the producers? I'm not a member of the PGA, but you got a credit. I got a credit. Now that I got the PGA mark twice, I think I automatically qualify as a member. But to join as a member, you have to work on a certain number of films or television episodes in a certain time frame, and they have to be qualifying uh, shows to you know qualify. To, and it's like they have a vetting process that's not always 
nice. Yeah, I bet it's got to be super competitive. Yeah. I mean, so I was trying to get in as a, uh, but to let you know, you are sitting, I don't know if it's true anymore, but there was a time up until 2019, I was the most awarded esports director in the world. Really? That and $5 would give me a cup of coffee. Okay, so hold on. I can't even get a cup of coffee for $5. No, there's $7 now. So what is what does it mean to be the most awarded esports director? Wait, technically nothing. Nothing. But what I would do is any show I directed, any show I directed, I would submit to, there's a, there's awards for everything and anything in this town. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and there's like, and you get awards for nothing in this town. Right. So essentially, it's if you go to a car dealership, it's like the the local best selling. Yeah, you know, it's you just spit your name and like they'll send you a plaque saying that. So it's like I don't want to discredit my awards, but you know, it's like I don't hold too much credence to my awards either. You know, it's like so. What I would do is anytime I directed any kind of show, I would submit it for you know this award, this award. I was the only guy submitting my esports telecast, my uh, simulcast, whatever you want to call them, Mm -hmm. to the Emmys. Mm -hmm. There was no category for esports. Oh, really? I'm the guy submitting, hey, I did this show. It's like, is it an arena show? It's like, I get, you know, I get nothing back. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I don't qualify. It's either I didn't qualify or it's like they don't recognize esports or it's like I was never a nominee in in the esports. What do you, what, so by so by esports you mean electronic sports so like gaming gaming yeah so we're not talking about the NFL anymore we're not talking not about yeah. unless you're talking about Madden football play it on the game I didn't I didn't work on that I love John Madden football yeah. I used to play that when I was a kid yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um so submitting the, to the Emmys you know so I'd find a category you know director or, you know programming you know so whatever category I could get in but there's no one specifically meant for esports so when I stopped. Not that I stopped doing esports, but you know, when I have a year of, you know, drought of not directing any esports, they come up with a category specifically for esports, and I don't have anything to submit. Oh, that's the right yeah. one. Yeah, I'm not saying I'd win, but I just, you, I'm a judge. I judge. I just finished the sports semis. I'll probably be doing the daytime semis. I I was disqualified for the local, for judging the local LA Emmys only because I'm working for one of the local stations, and they have a lot of shows submitted. So it's like, they don't want to. You know, make it look like a um, there's a conflict of interest, clear conflict of interest yeah. there. Yeah, for sure. But you know, it's I when I judge things, I, I I know a lot of people. I know what shows they work on, and I try to take that out of the element and judge the show on its merits of what they're going for. So I, I try to be, I pull no favors. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, no favors been pulled for me. <laughs> so what's it like being the technical director of like an an, an like were you like when you worked for the NFL, were you in charge of like just one team or were you in charge of like all NFL content? Like how does a job like that even work? Uh, no, for it's at the NFL, I was at, at the NFL network. Mm-hmm. So essentially the network is almost like ESPN, but it's just solely football. Right. Yeah. They have their own yeah broadcast on. I think just before I came, they were still doing uh, the weekend cheerleading and cheerleaders pillow uh, party. You know, it's like they'd have cheerleaders talking about stupid stuff I, the, before I got there. Yeah, that so, that kind of stuff's gone. Yeah. So they, they tried to rent. When I went there, they were ramping up content for, you know, the the sports fanatic, you know, who's highly into football. Yeah. Um, so uh, Total Access is their main staple show. Um, Which is a studio show. Studio show. Okay. Every, everything I worked on there was mostly studio shows. Okay. So um, I'd also handle early management Well. Because I knew the facility. It, as a technical director, it's not just knowing the switcher. It's knowing how everything works. So essentially, you're in charge of the equipment and a crew. And a lot of these house, the production houses, you know, as they have engineers to maintain a lot of the stuff. But it's like you need to know what the equipment can do. You also need to know what your operator can do. And if something's not working right, to be able to figure out, is it the equipment or is it the operator? And listen, there's a lot of the same competent people, but there's a lot of people who find challenging or, or lack the experience to do certain things. Not mm-hmm. to mean they can't learn or can't do it, but it's like you have to figure that out and like help make sure that when they show up to the party doing the show, they know what they're doing. Right. So, yeah, that's tough. So it's with that in mind, I mean, it's, it doesn't take long to get to know these guys. So as I'm working somewhere for years, it, you find out right away. And it's like at the NFL, we had, it was a level of, 
how can I say, we had some great guys, yeah. guys and girls, so not to be discriminatory, but the, this, the crew was absolutely amazing. Over the years, management's changed. Yeah, it's the crew has changed. Yeah. Did you ever get a chance to like work, like at it, like so like a, on the Super Bowl, or were you still in the studio for I, the Super Bowl? Um, I was still in the Super. I was uh, doing a lot of the. We had, even though there was a halftime show for the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. we were doing our own halftime show in the studio. In the studio. Yeah. So it's like um, it the big, like New Orleans, the lights went out. It was like right after halftime. Everybody's breaking for lunch, thinking we had another hour before we had to come back and do a rap show. Mm-hmm. It's like lights go out like five minutes into the third quarter. And it's like they're calling everybody back. We got we got to go back on the air. So it's like scrambling to get shit done. Sometimes it's pretty funny. That's amazing, though. Uh, Don, Donovan McNabb. I was working a shift where it's like um, he was what the Philadelphia Eagles quarterback, something like that. Yeah. You know, it's again. I know the. I don't know the, all the players now, but it's like. Uh, the key players you you get to know, mm-hmm. um, but uh, it's like something about him. It was him retiring, I think it was, and it was like big news where it's like our shift ended at five o'clock. I think everybody left at like four fifty-five. They give everybody a chance to. And I, nothing's happening. At five o five, the announcement came, so we were already off the clock. And at so five o six, we're getting called. Hey, can you come back to the studio? Can you come back to the studio? Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right, and we're covering news. Good. Oh, that's wild, though. Yeah. I mean, like... But there's so many... Stuff. Brett Favre. Brett Favre, I don't want to say he made me rich, but he's done me very well. For every time they he retired and came back to a team and went and went to another team, it's like, it was just work. It was just work. Yeah. So... What about... Uh, what about... Who's the who's the guy that just retired now? Uh, Brady. Tom Brady. Same, right? He, or did he only play on two teams? He went to the, what, Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, you know what? I've been out of it. I I didn't. What was uh, I didn't work this past season with the NFL. Okay. So, um, again, new management. I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we'll 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 leave that to speculation. Yeah. But that's um that's wild that you were able to use um your technical prowess, you know, to to make a career in in sports. And it just it it actually like it you know it was funny because I was I was reviewing your. Uh, your but, career is... Don't forget, I didn't work just sports. I worked... Um, the first year of working at the NFL, they, they were trying to expand, and they brought in this uh, AD. Well, they brought in Lern- Lynn Hermstead, who was an AD at the time on Dr. Phil, uh-huh. who later became the director of Dr. Phil. Uh, I was working with her at the NFL, and she's like, oh, you do anything else? I'm like, yeah, I freelance. I work everywhere I can. Are, are you in the union? I'm like, yeah, I'm in the union. Was I in the right union? Uh, probably not, but... Uh, um, she's like, hey, we got an opening for a fill-in over at Dr. Phil. If you want to come in, I'm like, sign me up. I'm there. So with, within a year of working at the NFL, I set up my basically talk show career at Dr. Phil. So for um, at least 16 years, um, 17, 18 seasons, because of the very last day where he wrapped his, his show, he was trying to put in two seasons of fill or like bumpers wraps is what they call them for the next two seasons because he was done with the re-airs mm-hmm. it was like I had a couple extra season I built for Dr. Phil <laughs> so you're working so you're working with Dr. Phil and you were working with we NFL the, the same Dr. Phil show I've never worked with Dr. Phil right the Dr. Phil show but you were doing that at the same time as you were doing the NFL stuff yeah absolutely how, how do you how do you manage that like what does that what does a day look like where you where you again you know so I'd work Dr. Phil in the day and go over to the NFL at night. And it's like, none of these jobs are, you know, five days a week or eight hours a day. It's like they have their own schedule. So Dr. Phil was typically, I think their schedule was, uh, initially it was like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, and then his, sh- his son and him decided to do a, a couple other shows like the doctors. Um, uh, what else do they do? Um, they had a couple of spinoff shows like the test or, uh, face the truth or, you know, what have you. So when they got the the other shows going on, it was like Dr. Phil Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Then I do the doctors on Thursday, Friday or other shows. But, uh, and then the NFL was, uh, it, it was always a, it was like pot, potluck where it's like, I, never, I didn't know my schedule. They just asked for my availability and I gave them, I'm open all the time. All right. Well, they just mark in like three, four days a week. So 
I think this is so interesting because you're, I mean, I think a lot of people watching don't really understand how this town works. Yeah. And they probably think like, oh, you work for the NFL, you must have like full-time job, nine to five, blah, 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 blah. Or you work for Dr. Phil and it's like you have an office to go to every day and really? blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So Dr. Phil, it's like every season you had to sign up as a new employee. Because you, you- Oh, that's, that's cheeky. Yeah. That, but you were never guaranteed work. Anyway, you're not guaranteed work as a freelancer anywhere, and even though I am a staff member of the NFL, uh, Dr. Phil, it's, they can cut me anytime. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's such a, that's such a hard mentality to get used to though, because again, like even though you're busy and you're hustling mm -hmm. and you're grinding yeah. and you're making it happen, you still have no job security. No, no, exactly. So it's just, again, being that being that name of like, who are you going to call? Oh, I know this guy. It's like being on that list. And again, you, you're you working so many jobs. And I'm not the only guy who works 100 jobs in a week. It's like I, I, I was, uh, you know, going about saying, you know, five, six years ago, I had over 20,000 hours of live television experience with, between that 24-hour news station, that, that sports network in Buffalo. Um, I, I, Florida. With Florida is like it was just half hour news, so it's like it was very minimal there. But it's like uh, Red Zone. Uh, I was doing Red Zone at the NFL Network, and that's like seven hours every Sunday of live television. You were sitting there doing cutting between each game for seven hours. Seven hours. You know, somebody give me a half hour break here or there, but you know, it's like it. But the show was fun to me to an extent. And I I was doing what I loved. Did you love? Do you love NFL football? No, no, no. I I'm not watching the game. Unless, and it's like my team, I won't say my team, but my team, it's not the Buffalo Bills, but uh, my team has not been doing very well over the last decade or two decades. New York Jets? No. Well, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> I've um, I've actually really enjoyed the Netflix series about the quarterbacks. Um, I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, they follow hard, they, hard, cool, no, hard, hardball? Is that no? No, full swing. Full swing is the golf show on Netflix, okay. and then the other one is um, break break point, which is okay. tennis, and then they've got drive to survive, which is Formula One, okay. and then they've got uh, Peyton Manning like uh, produced it, and it's uh, they follow Mahomes, they follow Kirk Cousins, who is with the Minnesota Vikings, I think, Mahomes with Kansas City, and another quarterback. Um, with another team, I can't remember his his name, but they follow these three quarterbacks over one season, mm -hmm. and it's all ups and downs, and and the ups and downs through their eyes, basically. Okay. And um, so I don't I don't like watching like a full game of football, right. and I can't sit down on a Saturday or Sunday and watch like a whole afternoon of golf. Yeah. But these like little bite size, you know, sixty minute episodes that are beautifully curated, beautifully edited, all the highs and lows, all the emotions, right. you know, family, friends, yeah. you know. Uh, stadium atmosphere, I, I I love it, and it's my little like my little guilty pleasure of of being involved in sports, but doing it in a much more time effective way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but not catching all the live stuff. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, it's a when you are working the biggest, if you're working the Super Bowl, it's like that's the show everybody watches. It's got the numbers there. I know the Oscars were toting like Oscar commercial charging rates for the commercials but uh, everybody's watching the Super Bowl mm. now everybody you know a guy like me is watching the Super Bowl for the commercials but you know everybody's there to watch the Super Bowl for the game and if you're if you're an, a technical director camera operator audio if what is whatever job you're doing on that kind of show and you make a mistake everybody's gonna see it well will everybody know it's a mistake not always people in the business will know uh, yeah 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 so it's like it, mistakes happen all it's live television mistakes happen all the time is there any delay in case anyone swears um what was i i was doing i was doing an oscar no wait i was doing the oscars uh red car before ktla and i know they had it on a delay just in case so it's like if billy eilish showed up i think somebody mentioned that yeah she's known for her drop of the f bomb which did we did we hit that no we didn't hit the delay at all even the guy there's a guy specifically ready to put his finger on the button every time they're like yeah, I didn't hit the button at all. That's good. It's like me, Mr. Spacely's a slave driver. I had to hit that button five times a day. So that's wild. So so if you're if so if there's a live event being filmed in this city, you're not using film. No, sorry, uh, being being televised. Um, like you're like one of the go-to technical directors. 
I, I'm, I'm on the list. Yeah. You know, it's, I did say at one point, I was like, I was in the top 10 of technical directors in town. Mm -hmm. I think I, I told that to a reporter. She uh, misprints it saying I was in the top 1% of technical directors in town. Oh, wow. So it's like, I guarantee I'm in the top 100 technical, 100 percent of technical directors in town. But sure. That means I'm I'm lumped in with everybody else. Well, that's good. So, I mean, like, and are all these other technical directors, are all you guys just freelancing, bouncing around day by day, not, week by week? Not everybody. I mean, it's, uh, again, you can have a staff job at KCELA, um, but, uh, you know, some of the best people I know are all freelance. Mm -hmm. Not to say you, you can't be freelance or, you know, it's a... Uh, as a technical director, if you had the chance to choose like one place to call home and be a full-time employee, it, does that job even exist? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Where would you name names? I could, you know, KTLA. Okay. Uh, local. Uh, I was a staff employee. I was a staff technical director at. Um, kind of horrible with the the names, but uh, the PBS station here in town, uh, KCT. Okay. It's like there's a lot of stories there too, but. Uh, um, but what I, you know, to, if we move this, the conversation to, uh, working in film, you mentioned, how did I get my, my career path to film? I was, I was with my, uh, um, um, producing partner. It's like, we kept, you know, saying to ourselves, we can, we can make a movie. If that guy can do it, we can make a movie. It's like, we started going to, uh, the PGA conference, which they'd have a conference for producers. And it's like they'd have these top producers talking about the craft. And it's like, I've met so many producers. I, I've met so many people in the industry. And, you know, it's, you'd always ask, what's the best advice you can give to somebody just, you know, trying to get into it. And if you want to make a movie, 95% of the advice I received was, go make a movie. You want to make movies? Go make a movie. 95% of the time. And uh, not to pitch my book, I did write a book. About how to make a movie? Ma Lessons for the Masters. Is what I called it, and I'm I'm not, I'm, the, I'm the cover poster child. I'm not the master, no. But um, you're the master of hustling and being busy, though. Holy shit! Oh uh, yeah, I try. <laughs> but uh, the idea is that so 95 percent of the advice is to go make a movie, and that is sound advice. You want to get into the business, you want to make movies, do it. You gotta you gotta do something. It's not just movies. You know, start a podcast, you get involved, do something you want to do, and start doing it. In my book, I try to use that that five percent of extra advice that they would, you know, give you to how do you go make a movie? Well, you know, it's like, yeah, go make a movie is easy advice. Well, how? So it's like I, all that little extra. Little thing. I think the first guy I had uh, um, that I talked to was uh, Ridley Scott, and that was the first guy you talked to. No, no, in the, the legend of the book. Oh, really? Yeah. You interviewed him for your book? No, I didn't interview him for the book. You know, I just I I took quotes on you know his. My memory shot. So, it's okay. so if I love Ridley, though. Somebody yeah. specifically, uh, that's a hard memory for me to, you know, it's like I, I know I could tell you roughly what he said to me, but it's to use his exact words on what he told me. Yeah. So it's like, it's it's all hearsay at this point. So anything is a paraphrasing. Yeah. Paraphrasing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in, in the book, it's, you know, Ridley Scott was notor not notorious, but uh, he's like, if you want to make a movie, grab two of your friends, grab a camera, go make a movie. Mm -hmm. It's like just do it, and you know it's to make to for me to make a good movie. It's all about the script. You have to have a good script. That's the that's the foundation. But you know, you talk to Christopher McQuarrie or Tom Cruise. They're making these Mission Impossible movies without a script. It's like they don't know where they're going. At least that's what they say. They have an idea, but it's like they're making a movie, and it, this is a big movie mm -hmm. you know, without a script or you know not knowing how they're gonna get to this point. Where it's like. They know they want to do this, they want to do that. But it's like, you know, working the finessing it along the way, and they have the ability to finesse it along. But and the, the time and the money. I think that, money. that's the real issue. But if you are doing it on such a small scale, you can make a movie with your phone. You can. And the quality is now, the quality is there that you can make a decent product on just your phone alone. As, a, as an amateur, will it be great? Probably not. But it's like, if you're starting out, you are starting out with, you got to learn your mistakes. You got to learn how to do it. You didn't, like when you're learning how to do something, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. That's why when you, I was starting out as technical director, if I started out in a small town, there's only a certain number of people that are going to see the mistakes I make and you try to learn from those mistakes so they don't have it again. So, um, making mistakes is the best. Yeah. It's all my, all my, when I switch a show, it's, um, 
how can I say this? I just switched uh, the first season, the first show of this season's uh, Real Time with Bill Maher. Oh, I love him. Paul Casey, I'm going to drop a name. Paul Casey is the best multi-camera director in town. I worked with him at Dr. Phil early on, and he would have three conversations. He'd be directing the show, having a conversation with the producers behind him, and then having a separate conversation with the guys on the floor, like joking around, talking, you know, talking shit into the microphone. And those would be the camera guys on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's a, it was a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. Paul, and it's like working with Paul on Bill Maher, it's not a hard show, but it's just, my nerves were just, you know, tweaked up a little more because it's, it's a big show for them. To me, I, I care less about the show. It's I'm not there for the show. I'm there. I was there just to work with Paul again. Mm -hmm. So, and it's real time with Bill Maher. So they shoot the whole thing without any editing. And it's, so that's, oh. that's a lot of pressure. Th there is. Yeah. I mean, th th it's a lot of pressure, but there's a delay. So if they have to fix something, they have the ability to fix it before it goes out. Okay. Well, that's smart. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. Cause a lot of the other, like, um, I, 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 I mean, can you cut I, that? I can cut it out, like, but I, I don't know, you know, as I signed NDAs, it's like, I don't know what they keep private or not, but it's like, again, it's they treat it live and it's like there it's only a fraction of a delay so in case that mistake happens they can fix it okay well yeah that's smart but it's still you know he's still standing there you know delivering everything live thinking live in the moment because a lot of the other news shows they, they're quite heavily cut right yeah yeah uh what's so, the like other one? if you're watching news ktla it's live mm -hmm. uh but like i'm assuming abc nbc cbs here in town live local television it's gonna be live I was thinking more like more of the satire news shows like maybe John Stewart uh, or Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, you know like those guys. A lot of the times, because East Coast is on a different time frame, it would be live on the East Coast, tape delayed over here. So the tape delay might have fixes in it. Oh, I, I never thought of that. Yeah. yeah. So it makes happens. sense. Makes yeah. sense. Makes sense. So so what was it like kind of moving back into, into the feature space after working in live events for so long? Um it changed my life. It really changed my life. You know, as a, as a director, television technical director, technical director, I'm a workhorse. I, I show up, do the job, and it's like, I'm the, you know, I submitted this, my shows to awards. It's like, I'm the only one promoting the show outside of the show. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I get recognition for it, but it doesn't, the show's over, it doesn't go on anywhere, it doesn't mean anything. Um, Producing my own content, you know, Putting myself as an independent filmmaker, my first feature film was, oh, we, we started making um, short films, like five-minute short films to see, test the water out. We, um, we'd write it on Friday, shoot it Saturday, and cut it Sunday. So it was like a 48-hour film festival kind of thing where it's like, and we learned that, you know, it's, it, you're doing the, almost the same amount of work on a one-day production as you would you know, for, for a five minutes short, as you would for almost a feature film, it's just more days. And it's like the best part of shooting a film is production. Absolutely. Being on production is the best. I, I mean, my editor, I could fire my editor. I fired my editor every day because I hate the guy. Oh, yeah, I'm the guy editing my own film. You know, I don't want to be the editor, but I, I'm in a position where I have to be the editor because I can't afford to pay the amount to, to hire a good quality editor. Absolutely. It's not easy. Right. Yeah. So, but for the work we've done, I think we've done quality work. Um, getting to uh, my feature film, Bottle Monster, we we dominated in the film festivals. We we did tremendously well. We didn't win everything, but we got into almost everything we submitted to, and we won nearly half of them. And it's like, it gets out into the public, you know, as a, you know, we start streaming it, and I get a, a troll saying, uh, you know, it's like, it's like a bad sci-fi channel movie. Like this, they spent two million dollars on a sci-fi channel. He's comparing me to, and I I put this movie together on duct tape and gorilla snot, and it's like, yeah, that's a winning quote for me. It's like you're comparing me to a expensive film, mm -hmm. so it's like it's showing the films we've made. The point was, this is what we can do for nothing, for nothing. Mm -hmm. If you want to give us some money, we can give you something. Yeah. Um, what was it? So what was the premise? What was the the story of Bottle Rocket? Bottle Monster, sorry. So it's a uh, Bottle Monster. We had uh, Willie Ames was the biggest name in our film, and you know he's probably the driving force of the people coming in to watch it because he's a known uh, talent. Uh, what was Billy Ames in? Sorry, I'm not familiar with. Willie Ames was in 
uh, Charles in Charge. He's like he was Scott Bayo's sidekick in a lot of movies in the '80s and '90s. He was in Zapped, um, but he was like uh, Eight is Enough, Charles in Charge, Zapped was his big feature films. But he was like a six the sex symbol in the '80s and '90s. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like we were all sex symbols in the '80s and '90s. Now this guy was he was on the covers, <laughs> uh, and and Willie Ames, great guy, great guy. So again. Um, biggest name on our show or in our in our film, I could tell you this: um, we lost our editor who was going to cut the film. So I, that's how I started editing that film. As an editor who didn't know what the hell I'm doing, Willie Ames made it very easy for me cutting his scenes. Willie Ames hit his marks. He did this. He might have changed things to tweak it for the you know the take or the you know it's the director's direction. But every thing was always consistent he'd hold his hand in a certain way turn in a certain way hit his mark i had one scene where it's like two people are standing one has a broom broom you know there's like so it's like you see the handle you know they pass the broom off and then they kneel down and they pass the broom back and forth so it's like every take the broom's in a different spot and it's like they're kneeling and crouching at a different time it was like it was the hardest scene for me to cut and it's like one actor was he he was an experienced actor, but he wasn't that experienced. But you know, he's, he's still a good actor. And the uh, actress, you know, it's again, she's been in the business, but not in that the, the starring role of a feature film. Mm-hmm. So, but it's like um, the it is the difference of having the experience of being in this industry for thirty, forty, fifty years. You know, Willie Ames was a he was in Swiss Family Robinson. Back oh, in wow. the 70s, he was a small child. So it's like he was, we had a, a bug. The whole premise of the movie is like there's a giant bug living in the basement. A giant bug. So um, we, uh, the, the story goes that Marjorie DeHay, the writer, director, producer on this film, we wanted to make a monster movie. So we're like, what's the ugliest thing we can find? Um, we went to a couple prop houses to have a, a puppet made. You know, it was like too expensive. We went to a, a graphics house to have a, a CG monster made. Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for three fast, you know, one second clips. That's insane. Yeah. So we went to the next best thing. Let's find the biggest, ugliest bug we can get. Find a, a handler. So for you know, dirt cheap. We had this person come in. She's got four four actors. That was a weep scorpion. Uh, you know, Billie Eilish, I brought her up earlier. Mm-hmm. Billie Eilish made it big with her first music video, I'm assuming. Uh, you should see me wearing a crown or something like that. In the video, she's got bugs crawling all, all over. The arachnid handler on that movie, worked, or the, the arachnid handler on that video worked on our film. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's like she had a wide repertoire of bugs, but, you know, ours was a whipped or a scorpion. She had four whipped scorpions. Each had its own name. It's each was a separate, you know, sort of like each character, different traits with inside the actors. I, the bug was an actor. Mm-hmm. They they called it an actor. Was it a giant bug in the basement? The bug, the we made it a giant bug. <laughs> so it's like the bug we use is real. Uh, proportionally, I just blew it up. Mm. So, Amazing. And it was it was a learning experience. And never shooting a bug before. And it's like I got a micro lens camera to you know make this thing big, but the the lens all of a sudden is like. Front of the, you know, you see its beady little eyes, and then all of a sudden, everything else is blurred out behind it. Yeah, because so, the focal length is yeah. totally wrong for. So it's like, yeah. you know, I, I, I was a cinematographer on this too, and that that's a long story to get into. I'm sure you're running out of time, but uh, we're not. We can go. Oh, look, we, I'm happy, man. I'm I'm loving this. This is like inside baseball. Just keep. So getting back to the short films, yeah. um, I was, uh, we had we were starting production on Saturday, talking to the camera operator Friday night he's like eh, I'm not sure if I want to show up I don't know he's like him and hawing are you fucking serious yeah so come Saturday morning when you know call time the guy's not there I'm like what fuck are you serious yeah. he just didn't even did he call he, he wanted to stay home and smoke weed well that's the yeah, yeah I understand so, that I guess so it was like the whole time I'm like well listen we don't have a camera this is like a radio show I was like oh fuck I'm sc- oh he was bringing the camera too he was bringing the camera so one of the guys had a, a girlfriend uh, working for Getty, and it's like they have some high-end cameras that you know it's like they had some uh, digital media cards that shot video. I'm not sure if she normally. Should. I know she shoots photographs, but it's like you can shoot video on her camera. Mm-hmm. Just, 
she came in. What was supposed to be like a 12 hour production day turned into like a three. So a 12 hour day condensed to three and we had to jam everything in there. We shot, it was not, it's not a great film to begin with. So it's like putting those restraints on it. You could see if we had more time, it could have been much bigger, much better, what have you. But when she had a job to go to like three hours into, you know, shooting this. So it's like, she's packing up. I'm like, Hey, can I grab the camera and shoot some extra stuff? You know, cause like if I didn't get the cutaways, we still would not have had a film. Mm -hmm. So it's like, because I shot the cutaways, I used to operate camera before I knew what I was doing. The producer, Marjorie Hayes, like, oh, you know what you're doing. This is great. So it's like, she chose me as her cinematographer. She could have gotten somebody else with more experience, but you know, it's probably at the rate I was charging, nothing. It was like, I was a cinematographer on Bottle Monster. So, and again, I dealing with things I've never dealt with before, the macro lens, it was like, it was all hit or missed for me, you know, showing up and am I going to get this? My biggest concern was, did we get film? Did we get everything to make them film? So it was like Bottle Monster, we finished Bottle Monster. And I was like, the biggest thing I kept saying to myself, we got a film, we got a film. And it's like, I could care less of what people thought about it, but we begin middle of end and it looks, uh, you know, it, it cuts it, you know, it's, it's a feature film. That's epic. How long was it? It's an hour and a half. Oh, wow. But it's like, it's a horror movie and you like to keep it in a, a certain time frame. Mm -hmm. You go anywhere longer, it gets, you know, too long. If it's anything shorter, it's too short. So rhythm and pacing is so important in everything. I mean, Jerry Seinfeld has a great line for this. He says like, at one hour, you might be the best comedian that they've ever seen live, but at an hour and a half, you know, yeah. you're just another hack. We, we, what we found on Bottle Monster, and it's like, I, Marjorie was, we, we were talking about this long before. Um, there's a movie called Safe, Safe Room? No. Uh, yeah, with uh, Ryan Reynolds and Denzel Washington. No. Um, That's Safe House, sorry. Uh, yeah, what do, you, what, uh, what do you call it? The sta there's like you escape, escape Room. Escape Room, yeah. So it's like the last the movie that came out was Escape Room. It's like you have somebody trying to escape from the opening scene. Somebody's trying to escape from a room. And then the next scene is like, well, how did we get here? Okay, so it's the pace is slow, so you got to build up characters. With Bottle Monster, we started out with who, you know, discovering who the characters are, what's going on. So it's like the, the pace is like it's a slow roller coaster where it's like it starts off slow. The first half hour is slow. Second half hour is like, oh, it's picking up pace. Last half hour, it's the ride. And it's like if we put a jump scare at the beginning of that movie, we would have done much better. Um, the biggest problem we had with Bottle Monster was marketing. We had no marketing. So uh, for independent films being released, it's not you're not competing with against films today. You're not competing with against films released this year or last year. You're competing with films that were released since 1935. That's how many movies are out there that you're competing against. And these judges at the film festivals watch everything. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and sometimes they can be harsh. I was like, I had some, you know, some critics, you know, like just bashing my film. It's like, eh, you know, it's, I don't think you're, you're qualified to be a judge if you're saying that. Well, if you haven't, if you haven't made something yourself, you shouldn't be judging. Right, right. Well, personal story, personal story. Yeah. Before, before even making my short films, I went to see a friend's film. It's like she, they made a short film. Um, it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. Uh, and, you know, my personal, personal note that I kept to myself, a tripod doesn't hurt you. Tri tripods are crucial. Yeah. Maybe even a slider. Hmm. Well, they, I got another story on that too. Or a dolly. But the idea is the movie is so bad, no matter how bad that movie was, at that time it was better than mine because mm -hmm. I didn't have one. And for anybody to criticize a movie... And, you, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, you can have a personal opinion about it, but to, come on. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a troll, no, don't be. Um, I took a, uh, the, 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 I got like side stories left and right, but at UCLA, I took a directing, producing, a writing, directing, producing class at the extensions. So three different teachers. Um, and once you pass one class, then you'd go on to make the movie. Or it's like they, they evaluated who's getting picked up to go on next. Um I, I didn't continue on, but it's like at the beginning of every class, we'd watch a short film and we'd talk about the short film. What do you think of this? You know, what do you like about it? What do you like about it? We show uh, The Session Man. Are you familiar with The Session Man? No, I've never seen this one before. It's, um, I can't remember the, I think with the guy from, oh, 
like I'll butcher all the names and other movies. We absolutely won't cut okay. that or edit it at all. Okay. So we just go for it. Okay. Don't worry no, about it. No, no. So um, it, it is a good actor, a relatively famous actor, but he's a session guy. So it's like he plays he plays a guitar. He he wakes up in the middle of the night with a phone call. Hey, can you come in? We need somebody to play guitar. They go. He goes. Shows up to the studio, and it's it's a band that sort of represents Guns and Roses, where the lead singer and the guitarist are having a fight, and they split up. The band's broken up. Hey, we need a new guitarist. Do you, you want to come on board? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'll come on board. It's like he plays guitar. They're like, oh, this guy's good. He it, it does this for a living. At the end of the movie, the guitar, the lead guitarist who quit the band comes back. They make up, and oh, by the way, session man, we don't need you anymore. All right, goes home, goes back to bed. Everybody in the class is like, ah, it, it was stupid. No, it's it yeah, the, the bashing it. And I, I was sitting there to myself thinking, you know, it had, it had the roller coaster. It was like, it wasn't a bad movie. It was, it was all right. So the three teachers are sitting in the front row. The directing prof professor gets up and, this is my movie. Oh, shit. And I won an Academy Award for this. Oh, really? So you guys can go fuck yourselves. Huh. And I'm like, right then and there, I'm like, yeah, that's that's my guy. Unfortunately, this, this professor passed away recently. So. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. But I love that attitude. Yeah. It's like, it's like I made something you didn't fuck you. Yeah. So it's like, I, I know it. Like, if you go to film school and you make a movie, the students are there bashing you. And sometimes it's a, you know, it's like, yeah, you got to learn from your mistakes. And if people don't point out what you did wrong or what you could have done right, you know, it. You know, it, it's a filmmaking. It's a filmmaker's school, not a film critic's school. Yeah. So, so bullshit critics and bullshit comments shouldn't be right. tolerated unless you're also making stuff. Yeah. 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 So it's like, uh, listen, I, this film coming out, The Mortal Thieves. Check it out. You get a chance. I will put this up against anybody's film. Anybody's film. And I think I will do very good. Okay. So, so how'd you get into Immortal Thieves? Um, wait, hold on. So after, after your first film, what was it like trying to now do a second film and what was the process like for making it? And did anyone give you any more money? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I, listen, we, it, I, I don't want to say family and friends, but it was basically family giving us money. Uh, the first feature, you know, it's like, again, the majority of the money came from one source, the source that you're not supposed to get money from. Um, I funded my own first television show. Yeah, I mean, it was that's how you do it. But uh, my my parents uh, gave me a, a good chunk of change. My brother jumped in on it, giving me a smaller chunk of change. But the thing was, I guaranteed their money back. I guaranteed their money back. So they had no losing opportunity there. I had a place in Hawaii. I worked a lot, so I bought a place in Hawaii. And when we sold it, Hawaii holds on, holds on to a lot of the money. So make sure you pay your taxes. You know, they got, they got a lot of foreign investors, so if they jump ship, they won't see the money again. So they hang on to the tax money. Mm -hmm. So it's like when I sold the place, I didn't get all the money I expected back, and that was at the time where we were making Bottle Monster. Mm -hmm. So I was able to guarantee their money back when I got that check coming in. So more or less, no, we didn't have anybody else funding it, but yeah, we did. And we learned something about Hawaiian real estate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, like Immortal Thieves... Um, my brother went in on it again. I told him it's going to be a much longer process kind of get the money out because, you know, independent films are notorious for not doing very well. Bottle Monster, you know, it's like we are very close to recouping everything on that film. Not quite there, but we are getting there. You talk about the, they talk about the long tail where it's like when you release a film, you get like high incomes and it's like it starts dwindling off slowly. We've got a long tail going up where it's like we're, we're seeing the same numbers monthly. Yeah. I mean, I still get royalties and stuff like that off of stuff I made in 2010. Yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, since our feature film came out, we have, you know, we were, we had um, the same conversation. One of the short films we did, uh, directed by Marjorie DeHay, that's on Amazon. And I saw a spike on the same conversation once Bottle Monster came out. Mm -hmm. So once, uh, like, a Mortal Thieves comes out, make sure you got that on camera there. Yeah, it, it'll spike. It'll spike all your previous work. It, you hope that you're going to find a new audience. That new audience goes back and sees what you've done before, and that's, that's what I love about the film industry. Mm -hmm. Each film tells a different path of that car director's career, writer's career, cinematographer's career. So it's like when I say I can put my film up against anybody's movie, 
anything. Mm-hmm. Hey, will it be good? Will it not be good? You look at Christopher Nolan's first film, Following. He shot it out of film, black and white. It, it's He's had a tremendous career off of that. Is it going to be as good as that? Maybe, maybe not. You know, it's but it's like he made a movie. I made a movie. Mm-hmm. This is his first film, my first film, John Carpenter's first film, first feature film I'm talking about, um, Dark Star. Mm-hmm. It was like the alien prequel. Mm-hmm. Not alien prequel. But the writers of Dark Star went on to do the alien movie. They're like, yeah, what if there was an alien real bug on this thing? It's like, so they went off and do alien. But it's like, how many people go back and watch Dark Star? It's like, I have it on DVD. So it's like, that's kind of fanatic movie fan I am. Um, you look at um, who's uh, uh, who did I just talk to? Oh, the Avatar guy, um, James Cameron. James Cameron. Yeah, thank. You. No worries. You just yeah, so, names escape us. Yeah. Uh, but he was working on uh, Piranha Two: The Spawning. Mm-hmm. Like that was his first feature film, and even then he struggled to make that. It's like I heard he had to break into the editing bay to finish the film for the producers who were trying to take it away from him. Yeah, that's amazing, yeah. isn't it? So it's like, and it's a movie I watched. Um, and it had, you know, again, it's it had uh, Lance Hendrickson. And you, you'll notice that the directors work with some of the same actors over and over again because you get a feeling of what they can do. And, you know, it's like you have this work rapport. You know, people want to work with people they want to work with. So it's like if you come in a hole on the set, yeah. you know, people don't want to work for you. Yeah, fair uh, enough, right? Unless, unless you're that, you know, I don't want I say anything against Tom Cruise, but unless you're Tom Cruise and you have that built-in audience that's going to watch your movie regardless, you know, it's like, people don't want to work with assholes. Mm. So, And there's not a lot of people, like, at that level that can, right. that, 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 you know, can get away with murder, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. You know, uh, again, the, the films I'm making, um, I, I've talked to a lot of, you know, I meet a lot of actors, and it's like, I'm not looking to meet actors out in public, but it's like, when I do, I'm almost vetting them to, I'm a total stranger. How do they act around me? Are they polite and happy? It's like, who's an a-hole? Who's not an a-hole? Basically, it's, it's like, who do I? Well, I mean, it's who's going to come to work every day, right? Like, yeah. who's going to come to work every day and do 12 to 18 hours and just grind it out with you from start to finish? Because you need, like, to make a film, you need to have, you know, 10 or 20 people around you yep. who are just as motivated, who are going to be there, you know, hour 17 day 23 yep. and be ready to go yep. when you need them they, they talk about hollywood flakes there's a lot of flakes in hollywood mm. where it's you, you say you're going to commit to something it's like i was five minutes late because i was trying to find parking here so i was probably in your mind is like is this guy got a flake on me mm-hmm. um not at all you look like a you look like a go-to yeah go-to well, reliable guy because of all these hollywood flakes my career has also been great the nfl it's like somebody either couldn't do the job or didn't show up for the job Hey, can you come in? I'm there. Yeah, being stable and reliable is such an easy thing to do. 90, 80% of the job is showing up. That's all you got to do. I would say 90. Yeah, I don't think it's that high. So maybe some talent is required at you some gotta, stage. You, gotta, you don't have to know what you're doing, but it helps. And like, you know, they say fake it till you make it. That takes you so far. You've got to be learning something, showing up to the job. I I, I take uh, phone calls and do these... Uh, interviews or talk to students all the time. Like uh, this past week, I talked to somebody at Brockport who's trying to get into this industry. And this industry is changing dramatically with AI and all this other function. So who knows what's going to be going on? Um, so I was like trying to explain to him, it's up to you to make a career. Uh, you're at college where it's like every student will be a piece of competition when you get out in the workforce, but they will also be your biggest ally so you make friends with somebody and something, a position opens up at station, production house, whatever you're doing. They know you're interested. They will pass your name along. Hey, call this guy. Or it's like companies now. They they have a, anything you find on LinkedIn, there's a job posting. They're required by law to post an opening. They already know who they're going to hire even before that. 90% of the time, I'm sure that's true. And they're taking either a referral or somebody already in-house. Yeah. So... Oh, I mean, because well, I, so in 2019, I guess, which was my height, I made like 10 episodes in 10 months. Each episode was about 46 minutes. My whole team, I had about eight guys on staff. They were all like NYU kids. Okay. Like I was like, I, I milked the NYU mafia. Yeah. You know, I had a producer from NYU. My director is from, or my uh, post-production supervisor, editor, NYU. One of my camera guys was NYU. My 
music composition guy and uh, uh, all NYU guys, and they were the best. Yeah. And whenever we needed someone else, we're just like, hey, guys, who's it? Who yeah. went to NYU that you know who can do this, this, or that? It's, it's a great thing to have. Yeah. Uh, for immortal fees, we didn't have that at all. We didn't have that. California law has changed. You can't volunteer anymore. You got you to gotta pay people. Um, so we had to hire a production payroll company, hire everybody on board this production. Um, Fuck, there's so many rules that I don't know. Yeah, it's, and it, the, the thing about making our films is even though we did it for nothing, next to nothing, we still followed every guideline that a professional film company would. We had permits. We had uh, stunt coordinators. We had a stunt coordinator for the stunt coordinator. SAG required this. Um, um, medics, COVID officers. You know, it's like we were above board. We had SAG actors, so we were required to have that stuff with California laws, meaning he's has, everybody has to be an employee. Nobody can be a freelance contractor anymore. Um, that's crazy. I didn't even I, know that. I'm not a, you know, I'm, again, this is hearsay. I don't, I don't know the laws, but I have a, a producing partner who's a lawyer who it is particular to hitting the T's and dotting the I's and uh, everything. Mm. Um, you need that nowadays because there's so many laws and regulations yeah. and there's, and there's so much, everything's changing all the time. If, right. If you don't have someone who's on that 24 seven, yeah. cause you can't be a, you can't be producing your film, writing your film directing your film and even maybe shooting and editing your film and still also have the mind to the legal mind to understand all the rules and regulations right. that the industry and right. SAG will throw at you and, and everything. And, and for when Marjorie's directing, and I know she's going to be directing another film here very soon. Um, it's having that, that backup to understand what's required. Um, she takes a lot of weight on her shoulders, knowing the law, knowing she's the writer of the, the group here. Uh, so she knows the script. She knows, as a director, she knows was she knows what she's doing, and as a producer, she handles a lot to be able to relieve a lot of the legality paperwork off her off her hands is something that's out of my realm. So it's like we brought in uh, Mo Wellen, who's a uh, she was going to law school, I think, and uh, so she really helped out of Mortal Thieves. Um, I know our producing partner Tony. Um, did a lot of work um, on the production, corralling all the actors. Um, I was going to say, getting that first break, you're talking about your NY, NYC students, um, our wardrobe person went to the fashion school here in town. She moved down from Seattle to go to fashion school. And it's like we gave her her first film. Uh, Bottom That's Monster. amazing, yeah. Yeah, so it was like she came on the Bottle Monster. She did um, Immortal Thieves. And she got a job at Universal in, in um, uh, the theme park handling all the characters over there, which is not a small job by any means. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, um, I, I think I just heard she might have just left. But uh, Isn't that cool, though, like when you bring someone in who's like fresh yeah. and the, and you give them the experience that allows them to go off and do something greater or, yeah. some, or something? Take, yeah. Taking any opportunity you can mm -hmm. to show what you can do. That's that's My movies are showing what we can do with nothing. Mm -hmm. So... I think we got some good films. Yeah. Although, so I, I was going to get back to uh, the, the shooting films. Marjorie was uh, volunteered on this um, all women's film project, so she was like an associate, an associate producer, something like that. Pretty, it's, I, it wasn't small by any means, but it's like the camera package and the equipment they got were like fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment to shoot this. Um, it was like a one day or two day shoot film shoot. For um, women in film, a uh, film competition, and like she's not the only. That wasn't the only group. There was like ten other groups of, and they all got this like the package of like fifty thousand dollars worth of film equipment. It's like that's more money than we spent on our entire film. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it had we had you know that type of equipment, um, well we wouldn't need more operators, but uh, you know it's like it's it. As to that cinematic value. Oh, for sure. So, yeah, what kind of cameras did you use on um, Immortal Thieves? Uh, well, in a Bottle Monster, we used the FS7 from Sony. Yeah, which, I use those for my TV the, show, yeah, FS5s and FS7s, yeah. yeah. So it's like, uh, I got, it was a rental package, um, and it's like, I got three lights. Mm -hmm. I got a uh, tripod, um, the camera, and that's about it. So Single camera, single tripod. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, not everything's on a tripod. I because of my experience shooting handheld, I got a solid 
I got a solid shot. If I can hold a handheld, not with like a shoulder brace, not with a steady cam, it looks like it's on a tripod. That's a huge advantage. Yeah. Because if you're so, mobile, you can shoot way faster. Right. So and that, that was whole like premise. And Immortal Thieves, it was like it's a run and gun kind of production. Um da -da, coming back to but the problem was I didn't have very many cinematic shots. It's like they say keep it movie, meaning keep it moving. All my shots are locked down, like handheld, like I can move you see the give it the the motion, like it's you're in the motion, like um, you watch any TV show, it's always a moving camera. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a scene, a couple scenes of um, the West Wing, and every all the cameras were on tracks. So it's like they're always dollying one direction or, you know, rolling in, rolling out, doing something, but the camera's always moving. Mm -hmm. the, and Bottle Monster, everything is like locked down, or it's like the handheld is not noticeable. Mm -hmm. Which is amazing because yeah. that's that's a real skill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have to say, if you want, have you ever seen Bottle Monster? Bottle Monster, it's available everywhere. And everywhere you watch streaming, except HBO and Netflix, don't go there. Um, this house had mirrors all over the place, mirrors everywhere, and not just flat mirrors; they concave mirrors that show reflections in every direction. And you have to play all those reflections. Yeah, and it's like the whole film takes place. The, the majority of the film takes place in this house, and the fact that we had. There was only one shot where the boom was in the mirror. It was a, it was a God send to me. You know, was, I was able to do some little video tricks to remove the shadow. But uh, you know, it's like it, it was a it was amazing. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's again, I was surprised we got a film in the can when we did, and it's like it's it, it's a good film. I think it's a good film. What what's it been like for you? Like, I mean, I I really feel like working and being a technical director from what you've explained. You know, and then also doing narrative feature films. It's like left brain, right brain. Like I, I, I it's it's two totally different skill sets. Yeah, but it's, I was gonna say it's a uh, my life changed when I started making movies. It's like it, I would say it opened the door. The doors are always open. It, you would be surprised at Hollywood. Doors are open everywhere. It's just a matter of knowing where to look. If you got your hand up for you know money or. Anything more than, you know, free advice, it's going to be shut in your face. But, uh, you know, the opportunity is there to talk to anybody. You know, it's like people will be happy to talk about the ex their experience. Like, who wants to hear about the fucking technical director? You know, it's like, yeah. no one's, I'm sure I'm the first technical director talking about the craft. And it's like, I don't even want to talk about the craft. I mean, I, I you know what, I had an amazing chat a couple of weeks ago with a production services uh, company uh, owner. And he was telling me all this amazing stuff about what happened during COVID and COVID protocol and COVID budgets. Yeah. And, you know, like, and, and how, you know, how it works with all the big studios and how it works with independent films. Yeah. And I love all this stuff. And it's just so nice to, like, meet someone. And he's been in the industry for, like, 20 years, too, and how it's changed and, yeah. like, the, the demands that, you know, these big studios have versus independent film and and I just find it fascinating because I love how stuff is made. Right. Like, I've made, I've probably made more than 50 hours worth of episodic adventure television yeah. right and i've had to produce direct and host the majority of the shows and and but i love it like i love seeing how other people make a dollar stretch i yeah. love seeing the tricks it's, i love it's the real thing is making that dollar stretch yeah and and you know and i and i basically had to produce and direct my own shows because to save money yeah because we could we had such a low limited budget and i wanted to spend as much of the budget as possible on the location because the locations are really exotic, they're yeah. really beautiful. So we tried to trim as much as we could from other places, which then ended up being me. Yeah. But we had to have the good gear, we had to have drones, we had to have great cinematography. I, the, the problem with owning equipment is after a period of time, it comes outdated. So uh, for for the Immortal Thieves, I went out and bought the equipment. So I, uh, Marjorie directed this uh, uh, short film in upstate New York. It was a period piece with uh, one of our uh, uh, James Lulo wrote this uh, period piece about the area he grew up in, uh, about the Underground Railroad. It was a wonderful story. Uh, Goldenrod, if you, if you get a chance to see it. The, the Underground Railroad is the uh, yes. trails that were getting slaves out of southern, out of the southern U.S. into the northern U.S. where they would be free. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not the railroad that goes underground. Right, because we got a lot of inter international. We got a lot of international people following on that I, might not be I aware. Of. Jokes about it, but yeah, that's that is the case. Yeah. It's a wonderful story. Um, but her photographer was uh, Keenan. He was using a, a Blackmagic pocket cinema camera. Uh, am I saying that right? 
Um, I know the one is shooting 6K. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, that looks like a great camera. And it's like I saw the footage coming out of it. I'm like, that looks great. So I went out and bought one. So that's what I was going to shoot Immortal Thieves with. Marjorie's in a, she's a, in a meeting or it, it, with a group of people and Ridley Scott's talking to him. He's like, he's talking about his um, Gucci movie. Uh, oh, the one with Adam Driver. Yeah. yeah. He's like, yeah, I shot with 23 cameras. If you can shoot with more than one camera, do it. I get a call from Marjorie to, hey, hey, that second camera you wanted, do it. Yeah, like, no, I'm right. So it's, so, but the problem is, I'm just one guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like, um, I had uh, my nephew come in and sort of operate the second camera. He's not a camera operator. So it's like, um, I'm helping him out as much as I can. But it's like, he didn't, I don't think he had the motivation to, you know, dive into the career of it. it we got we got footage out of it. It's great, um, and a lot of times I would have one camera set up on a tripod. the The idea was to shoot two different people to cut time. Yeah. And what I did is I sort of just set it up on one person to get two different angles, and then it was like I didn't save any time shooting. Well, what, you know what we did. So during COVID, we were on such a restricted budget, um, and we had such difficulty getting the people we wanted to work with me. Yeah. Um, we we would have two cam like my my camera operator at that time, Chad. Like we would have two cameras and we ended up buying two external screens okay so that he could set up one camera hold the hold the screen see the frame to set up the second camera get there and then roll both cameras and he would, and he would basically be watching both screens okay. and be like action yep. and then we and then we go and then he could basically just make sure that we were in the right frame and the right focal length yep. for the whole scene make sure we were in it and then it would be a cut and then we could go back and look at it. But he was able to manage both cameras uh, by himself. And it was amazing that he took on that responsibility because it's yeah. not easy managing multiple cameras as a single, you know, director of photography. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely a challenge. So, um, but it, again, it was showing what we can do with next to nothing. They, they, the cameras themselves were, I, I, I bought the equipment, lights, cameras, sort of like almost the same package I had for Bono Monster, but now we own the equipment. So essentially, I just shot a PSA last night. I just cut it this morning. Um, I've been called up to do, um, let me pitch another logo here. There you sure go. stay. So it's, I, I love artists. I love all types of artists in, in the industry, whether you're doing audio, you're an editor, you're, you know, a, a recording audio, um, makeup, props, what have you. It, everything is a craft and in that craft, you become an artist. Um, I was doing a lot of esports stuff, and everybody has their own esports uh, name or stuff, uh, you know, associated with their team or what have you. I was a big surf fanatic when I was, uh, you know, a teenager in upstate New York. Everything was about, you know, it's like a surfing culture. There was no surf, surf in Rochester, um, sadly. Yeah. But uh, one of the guys who created the characters for the town and country sports, uh, the town and country surf design. It was a guy named Steve Nazar. And like I said, doors are open. All the doors are open. If you just got to track down who you, you know, it's like who you want to know. As I contacted Steve Nazar, I'm like, hey, listen, I, I want to do a, a design around this. Uh, you know, I own the website Surf Snake. I own a, you know, my online persona with Surf Snake when I'm playing games. Um, I, you know, it's like nobody knows me by that outside of family. Basically, mm -hmm. um, it's like Steve's like, yeah, I, I've never done a snake before. I'll do it. It's like he he's designed these characters off of famous surfers, and he's like, they're iconic characters. If you're in that surf um, culture from the '80s, '90s, and he's still doing it today, he's retired. But uh, you know, it's like he was able to do another you know logo for me. Mm -hmm. Who was that famous surfer in the '90s? Kelly Kelly Slater. He's the big one. I only remember him because he was on Baywatch, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, I was talking about my producing partner. She's in Baywatch too. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah that's so, great. But I mean, it says she had like a uh, one episode. I think she was, she was labeled as hot chick. <laughs> that's that's it's, a great credit. Each boy's episode. Sorry, Marjorie. <laughs> that's awesome. No, I only know anything about Los Angeles uh, from uh, or Malibu from uh, from yeah from Beach Baywatch yeah. back in the day. Yeah. No. I was gonna say it's like uh, it, it was just watching TV. It's like everything's just shot around here. It's like you know, it's uh you. you having to drive by locations like hey that's uh so-and-so from that movie mm -hmm. but that's like every time i drive by fox studios like nakatomi towers um you know die hard yeah baby yeah. yeah 
Um, it's like every, everywhere. Uh, I know Larry David when he's shooting um, Kirk Kirk Kirk, I love, I love like, Kirk. My brother lived in Santa Monica for years. It's like he was like, yeah, Larry just Larry walks this area quite a bit. Yeah. He doesn't want to talk to anybody, but uh, you know, it's like, yeah, I saw Larry David again today. <laughs> I lo I love that show so much, and I love the way the the actors talk about working on it, like the way that all the scripts are really loose. Yeah, and they imp they basically improv each yeah. scene. Uh, it was it Jeff Garland? Mm. I haven't talked to him. Uh, you know, I've, I've met him a couple times in the past. He wouldn't remember me from a hole in the wall, but it's like I, I remember seeing a discussion about him talking to Larry about you know putting that show together, where it's like Larry wanted to do. It was like it was interesting how they put the show together and how it came to be what it is. Mm -hmm. So, and it's like Jeff Garland is not just a character; he's like he's a producer. He, I think, he might have directed a number of episodes. Yeah. I don't know, but uh, I've just started. So, because of the last season of Curb, it has just come out, yeah. um, and is I think is just finishing now. I've now started watching it from season one again yeah. in my spare time. Whenever I have a time, I'll try to watch an episode just as a, to pay homage to the great Larry David. You know, I worked on a couple of those. Did you? Yeah. So it's uh, my name's not on the credit list only because they came into the you used a Dr. Phil the episode uh, vehicular fellatio. They, that they, sounds they, fantastic. They come into Dr. Phil's set, and I guess they're talking to Dr. Phil or so, they're using his set. So I'm working the show. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I, I'm not sure if I'm giving this away, but I was told not, I didn't sign a non disclosure, but I was told not to say anything. But uh, I worked this past season too. It's like, I'm not, I don't know if they cut, dropped the storyline or not, but uh, something about, um, I don't know, I just, uh, uh, the boss, Bruce Springsteen. Oh, really? Yeah. I love him. Getting COVID. <laughs> so it's like, and it's like, that's all I knew about the show. So I'm like, I, I mentioning the producer, Larry gave him COVID, didn't he? It's like, yeah, don't say anything. <laughs> oh my God. So if I, you haven't seen it, you didn't hear it from me. Yes. If it didn't happen, it was cut and I'm making shit up now. What's, what's the, I <laughs> It, it's it's amazing. What's it like actually just like making a living and being in this ecosystem in Hollywood, making movies, making television, being called on by these, you know, creative forces of human beings that just turn out great stories all the time? Uh, well, let me let me first and foremost say, anybody listening, I am available. Call me. I'm available <laughs> to you, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a it, it's amazing. I mean, again, I I do this because I love it. It's like. I love working in production. Production is the, it's like a, it's the sandbox of creativity. It's like everything, you know, it's like it, editing has its own world of creativity on how to make the movie, but it's like, it's in production. You're hanging out with everybody. It's the, it's the collaboration of, it's the apex of collaboration. It's like everybody's on the set and you got different actors who have different mindsets or, you know, uh, different personnel you know it was like give them their two cents we had the grip from pulp fiction working on um immortal thieves so it's like I, my movies tied into some big movies just by this little small lineages yeah so roy roy uh nigra there's a shout out to you i love um i love being in production too i love the creative process i love having the time to try things and like you know, when uh, when your DOP says, hey, you know, let, let's flip this around and try it a totally different way. Or when one of the cast or yeah. one of the people you're working with wants to try something different, yeah. like, and then it works and then you use it. It's just, right. it's beautiful. Um, two things, Immortal Thieves. It's, it's Immortal Thieves, a bloody heist. Um, we shot during COVID. We had a couple of actresses drop out during COVID and we didn't have money to extend the days of shooting or come back and shoot it again later. It was like, we got to figure out what we're doing. So you had to change the story? Yeah. So it's like there's a big scene where all the thieves are at the safe house. It's a big group scene. So it's like we had a stand-in for this uh, the one main actress who, first, I, I'm not sure she was watching this, but I think she just wanted to go to uh, Santa Barbara for the weekend and not show up. Yeah, she she had COVID though. She had COVID. <laughs> so it's uh, you know it's uh, it worked out. It worked out fine. Um, but the we had to change another actress got COVID and I think she really got COVID where we had to change a scene completely. And, you know, it's like we did, I probably changed the movie, not for the better, but we still got a movie. It's the movie we have, I think is a good movie. It's, it's, there's more action, more packed. There's more, it's, it's an ensemble cast almost. Um, and it's the, the whole movie is misleading where it's like, you think you might know what's going to happen. You don't know. It's going to happen. You think you know the guy who's doing this, you don't know. It's like, 
there's I as the director of this thing, I didn't want to explain everything that's going on. I want the audience to, you know, figure out for themselves. So my biggest fear is people are going to see the first half of the movies like what is going on? Mm -hmm. All comes together at the end. But uh does it all come together great and nice and neat? No. No it doesn't. But uh um I the biggest fun of doing a feature film like this is the little inside jokes and I have to say um I got a group of thieves. You know, you go to Starbucks, they you write your name on the cup. So it's like a group of thieves sitting around the table. They all have coffee cups. It's like three of them have their names on it. And somebody has a random name put on their cup. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, there was a somebody at SAG who was giving us a big, hard time uh, during the production. It's like, put their name on the cup. So it's like, the, the thieves stole their coffee. Mm -hmm. Like, that's my little, you know. Get you back at that sag. Yeah. Wouldn't it be? Wouldn't it be? Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great to go back to like Reservoir Dogs and have them all sitting at that at that table, like Mr. Pink, Mr. White, you know, with all their with all their Starbucks names? Yeah, for like from the heist. That would have been amazing. Yeah, and um, and I think I again, Marjorie DeHay wrote this, but I think the initial idea was the unreliable narrator kind of storytelling, where it's like you don't know what's going on, um, where it was like it jumps around a little bit too. So it's like, it's not a, a linear storyline. It jumps. Mm -hmm. So, and I just, I hope people understand how things are jumping. And it's like, because there's so many characters, I started putting like people's names at the front of it. Like this is Margantina. This is, uh, you know, Dakota. This is Miami. No, it's like uh, the kid. So we got a various names. So it's like, they're, they're all, distinguishable but it's like you can get lost on who's who's who mm -hmm. so it's like i try to put their names to make it easier for the audience even though i don't want to have to tell them everything you know it's like i'm trying to maintain their attention a little bit like all right this is this guy's story the the one theme the one theme the one theme i'm really picking up on you and your work is um a lot of young filmmakers and even a lot of middle-aged theme maker, filmmakers they really are perfectionists, and it's and a lot of them I think don't even want to begin something unless it's already perfect yeah. in a way that they feel confident that they'll make it to the end, right? But actually, what I'm getting from you, and I'm very much the same way, you just have to go out and do shit. And when you go out and do stuff, you just have to make sure you get to the end, and it doesn't have to be exactly the way you saw it in your mind. Yeah. It doesn't, but it has to be finished, right. and it has to be as good as you could have made it in the moment, yeah. dealing with what you had to deal with. Yeah. And then you put that out into the world, and you're proud of it, and then you move on to the next one. Yeah. But right now, we've got some Mortal Thieves out to um, uh, a lot of film festivals, mm -hmm. and we're waiting for an acceptance uh, and official selection. No film festival is seeing the same feature. It's like every time I send it out, I'm, I've tweaked it a little more. I tweaked it a little more. I tweaked it a little more. And even last night, I shot, I, I can't say this for uh, sag reasons, but I shot some like B roll. The, the worst thing I had in this film was my special effects guy. Mm -hmm. He was just absolutely the worst. He didn't know what the fuck he was doing. We're going to drop a name on that? Yeah. Hey, I don't know what the <laughs> fuck I'm doing. <laughs> so it's like, if, if I had so anybody with any credible experience with special effects, it's like, I've tinkered with Adobe um, After Effects. Mm -hmm. I'm not a master at it whatsoever. It's like, the effects you see are pretty rudimentary. YouTube. You want to learn anything, go to YouTube. Yeah. It has everything. Natalie Portman told me, YouTube is your friend. I put this whole studio together based on YouTube. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, and it's a, it, it's great, but it's like, again, unless you do it and you're there with somebody who can critique you, okay, do this, do this, tweak it. You know, It's like, you, I'm, I'm scraping by. I'm just, I'm, it's good. It, it's, it's, it's not good. It's, uh, it's, it's passing. Mm -hmm. Minimally, it's passing. You know, um, the effects I have in my movie are lame. Anybody else come in, they can make it m more kick-ass. But for me, it's good enough. It says what I want to say. And if I had money, if I had the money to be able to pay an artist to do this, it would be a much better film. Mm -hmm. But this is the film we made for nothing. Mm -hmm. This is what we did with nothing. So if you want to criticize me for what I fucking did with nothing, go fuck yourself. I love that. Um, <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, because... Because when you when you make something with no budget, then you can use that and shop it around and be like, okay, hey, someone give me a half a million or a million dollars. I already have a name I'm going to be contacting in, I think he's still in England, where it's like, I'm not DGA. 
Um, I'm not saying I wouldn't turn down DJ if they offered me a membership. Um, but once you become DJ, you can't work non DJ jobs. Oh, really? Well, they, you can do a consulting and a lot of directors will go on to do other things. I'm just a consultant. Mm -hmm. They're direct. Oh, that's interesting. So it's, um, uh, Rhonda Moore, D Moore. Uh, I, I hate to give his name away because it's, he's my, don't call him. So he's your director. He's my producer that I'll be contacting. I'm going nowhere with this. It's like I just talked to him uh, years ago, and he's like, "Yeah, I was having a hard time finding directors who are non DG out here because he's shooting. In, he was shooting in England at the time. I don't know what he's doing anymore, but um, you know, so there are opportunities out there for bigger productions and non DJ. Mm. So essentially, like Marjorie DeHay, when we did Bottle Monster, we shot we shot before COVID. And we did very well at the film festivals. The only problem was when we released, it was during the um, COVID. So we couldn't go in person. So we didn't meet anybody in person. We did a number of Zoom things. But it's like Marjorie should have had an agent, manager, and just, like signed out to do episodics at some studio going somewhere because she's that good. Mm -hmm. Out of all the, the producing partners here, I'm, I'm probably dragging everybody down. Marjorie's the real brains of the operation. She's the key to the, our, our success. So once you've, down. once you've got a film in the bag yeah. and edited and ready to go out, how, how do you go about like distributing it to film festivals? Like what's your, I mean, uh, it's, it's, you know, you got a complete film, you just submit it to free, film freeway is the easiest way to do it. But mm -hmm. so, I mean, if you have an inside contact, which I don't at these South by Southwest, uh, Sundance. Sundance yeah. It's like, um, I, I just got some, yeah, what was his name? Um, some, he was like a utility, um, Brothers McMullen. Who did Brothers McMullen? Oh, I love that movie with, uh, the, the um, yeah, yeah. What, what's his name? Exactly. Oh, I forgot his name. It doesn't matter. I'm not yeah. pitching it. I'm not selling his book. I can't yeah. get my book. Uh, I'm sorry about drug. No, yeah. I, I love it. I love it. No, uh, I, regardless of what his name is. He was working for E.T. as like a editor or, you know, something. And he made a feature film or he made a, a, this independent film, uh, you know, next to nothing. Uh, Brothers were all and I think is what it was. Um, but he had a videotape and he, he was on a production that did an interview with Robert Redford. And he had the, the gumption to grab a videotape of his movie, hand it to Robert and say, like, hey, Robert, I made a movie. Do you look at it? Did Robert watch it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But he passed it off to his, uh, you know, film director, the festival director at Sundance. He got picked up at Sundance. Oh, that's a, whether that's the, a great story. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's all about that, that chance meeting. Mm -hmm. So And taking that risk. Yeah. And, and a lot of the times, like, I think I've gotten a couple of jobs. Like, I got, I could have had a job at the Tennis Channel. I, I shouldn't, I forget I mentioned Tennis Channel, but. A lot of the jobs I have received, this is a little, it's not a trick, it's not a, you know, a gimmick, but it's like you find somebody higher up and introduce yourself and like so-and-so, and, -so, and I'm, I'm interested in working over your company as a, you know, director. Oh, really? Contact this person. Mm -hmm. You contact that person and say, your boss said to contact you about this position. Mm -hmm. They're like, the boss said, mm -hmm. okay, I'll do, what the, I'll do what the boss says. Yeah. And you're, you're going to get a conversation. Yeah. Yeah, at least so, you have a dialogue. The funny thing is, so it's Tennis Channel. I, I the the CEO of Tennis Channel. I, I had a conversation with him. He's like, "Yeah, here's here's two names. Contact them." So I'm like, "All right, hey, so uh, your boss said to contact you." It's like, "Why would he do that?" He's like, "We're not hiring." Like, yeah, you know, it's like if you need me, call me. I'm the real deal. Yeah. So it's, I'm driving to Palm Springs. I'm halfway to Palm Springs. Somebody's giving me a ride. My car is out in Palm Springs. Uh, so I'm a passenger in a car ride halfway to Palm Springs. I get this text message. Hey, can you come in and direct today at the Dennis Channel? I'm like, are you fine? Yeah. If it was me driving out there, I would have turned the car around. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's I'm stuck in somebody else's car. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. I mean, yeah. that, that's just another feather in your and, cap. And it's like, well, okay, can you come in next week then maybe? Mm -hmm. But the, whatever happens is the guy they called in did such a good job. I'm sure he they came in the week after. They didn't need me ever again. So every now and then I'll reach out to that person like, hey, uh, you still need a director? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we're good. We don't, for the moment, we don't, for the moment, yeah, for the moment. So it's still going to be that that opportunity. Yeah, my name's on the list. Mm -hmm. Whether they remember to look at the list at the time they're looking for somebody, 
it's up to them. But uh, so, how are you enjoying your your push into features? Like, are you are you definitely going to be making more? I love it. Hey, I, um, we would definitely be making more. We've got a slate of at least five five feature films, and we got some we got some great scripts. We got some scripts that need some tweaking, and we got some scripts that are being worked out right now. So it's like this is this is the beginning of what we're doing. And we're in such a time where you can make a feature film for next to nothing like we've done. Mm -hmm. We prefer to make movies with a little extra cash in our hands. Um, but the great thing about what we've done is we own it. We control it. I, I worked on a TV pilot where it's like um, I didn't write it. Um, I just directed it. I was an executive producer on it. I put some money into it, but I didn't write it, so I didn't have control over it. And I don't want to say might have been off their medication, but they went crazy. And it's like, nobody, nobody can see this movie now. Nobody can see. It was like, no one can watch this episode. It was like a short film. It was supposed to be like a TV pilot. Mm -hmm. and no one's seen it. Because, because someone just went off the, yeah. someone just buried it. I showed it. I was able to show it before this happened to somebody at Universal, a vice president in production. And they're like, yeah, we'd be, we'd be interested in this. Mm -hmm. I was like, you guys are trying to steal my movie. It was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and so like, mm. And it's like, it was a great, it was a great show. It was a great show. So that's what led us to make sure we own and control what we have. It's like, I, I'm not the, money is not my whole desire in life. I can, I can care less about money. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've had a good career that, you know, my career pays me a lot of when I'm working, but the idea behind my film is I want to show people what we can do and what we can do for nothing. So it's like if you if you contribute, just that money would go so far as to make a better movie. The problem with Immortal Thieves, I got great actors. I got great actors, and even like some of the parts that uh, were lately that were cast last, we got two fantastic actresses. The problem is they're not named people. They might be in the industry, but they don't have that big name recognition. But it's like I personally think. Any, any one of my actors can have a big moment and they can explode. That's how good they are. Mm -hmm. So it's, but it's, you're putting that gamble on not having a name. It's like having Johnny Depp and um, Freddy Krueger's uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. It's like, no, no he was going to blow up. Mm -hmm. um, where Leonardo is like his first feature, whatever that was. Or is that Edward Scissorhands? No. I don't know. Uh, what's eating Gilbert Grape? Yeah, probably. Yeah. With River. Yeah. So and we all know what River is. What a talent, yeah. man. So, uh, it's again, it's it's finding that talent. It's like it, anybody can have the talent. Any Anybody can get it. But it's like taking it to the next level. How do you how do you find your actors? Do you have a casting director? Do you find them on social media? Do you find them on IMDb? What, what do you, how do you make that work? It's like uh, Marjorie specifically wrote a number of roles for, uh, like, Kim Estes. He's, uh, he's an Emmy, uh, Emmy award-winning actor. Um, he's right now, he's the governor of the actors for the television academy. So he's, he's probably up there. You might not recognize his name offhand, but he's a, he's a good actor. Yeah. Um, you've probably seen him on TV before. You say, you've seen him, he, his credit list is, I'm sure very long. Um, and it's like, we just drove around. It's like, okay, we, how can we kill him here? It's like having fun with friends. Like, how do we, how can we kill you in this movie? It's like, so it's like Marjorie's a big component of like, uh, different ways to kill people. Oh, that's that's an important task when you're doing horror yeah. films and, yeah. and and things like that. But um, um, Marjorie discovered a Zeke and Wes, who are the they're not they're not stars. I mean, Zeke's the star. Uh, Wes plays his brother. Uh, it, it's it's really an ensemble cast, so I, they're all stars to me. Uh, so I don't want to you know not credit anybody who you know did a great job. Yeah. Um, but um, like Zeke, uh, Zeke just. He was studying to, for the bar exam while he was doing, you know, Immortal Thieves. He, he's since gone on to pass the bar exam, and now he's working on a presidential campaign. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. So, uh, and um, um, Lizzie Pete, um, we had Claudia Wells, who was the girlfriend of Marty McFly in the first movie. Oh, really? Okay, I remember her, yeah. So she was in Bottle Monster, and it was like, it was such, a, it wasn't such a small role, but it was a... Um, no pivot, is, pivotal pivotal role. It was a very, uh, yeah, I'm sure we could have cut it. It didn't mean any, 
it was just the idea is a, a, a woman fighting. Bottle Monster is about a woman with an alcohol problem running from her problems. And she runs to a rent a house that has more problems than she does. And she has to give up alcohol and fight the monster, but she fights the monster. Simple as <laughs> very nice. Yeah, so uh, there's more to it than that. And it's like, it's just to have the nuances of like what the movie's really about. And it's like, again, you read critics and reviews. It's like, man, you didn't, you didn't get the film or maybe I didn't explain it right. Or, but everybody else seems to love it. You know what I'm like, <laughs> I think, I think every film or television critic at the end of, at the, so if, if they write something about your work, at the bottom they should put their own credits. Yeah. And then if they've never made anything, they can yeah. put like I have well, never made, I have never told any stories. Well, that's I again. I'll put my movies. I will put my my Immortal Days. I'll put that up against any movie. Christopher Nolan's first film, my first film, and whoever critic wants to bash my film, I'll put it up against your film. Wasn't and if you don't have a film, then you already fucking lost. So shut the fuck up. Sorry, that's exactly it. I, I'm sorry. I love it. No, I mean, like, this is, people don't understand, like, how much passion we put into, like, yeah. telling these stories or visiting these places or, you know, realizing, you know, these character roles, arcs, yeah. stories. I mean, it, yeah. it, 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 it is like blood, sweat, and tears. And then when someone who's never made anything yeah. just tears you down, it's, yeah. uh, it's pretty ugly. Yeah, it's sad. I think it's sad. Again, I can't say anything negative about, if you made a movie, this might Immortal Thieves is better than Quentin Tarantino's first film. It's better than his film automatically. You know what his first film is? No. Well, neither do I, but I know it didn't get made. No, I... It's not, it's not Pulp Fiction. It's not Reservoir Dogs. He made a movie before Reservoir Dogs with his friends. It took years. Yeah. And it's like, it, it didn't get completed. Yeah. So that's what I'm considering his first film. And for him, it was like, it was film school because he made a film. Mm -hmm. It's... It was crap. He knew it. I haven't seen it, so I don't want to say anything against it. But you know, until I made my movie, it was still better than my film. Yeah, no, it's true. Like if you've made a film and put it out into the world, it's better than anyone else yep. who's never. Yeah, made. but again, Quentin, you know, sort of saw the idea that how bad it was. It's not worth putting out there, and it it might be worth something to put out there now to say, this is where I was at. This this is what I learned from. And obviously, he was at the video store watching movies left and right. He's a, he's a, Quentin's a freak. You know, he, he loves movies. And I love that. So. I really, okay, so let's talk about Quentin for a sec. So he's coming out with his last feature film. So he wanted, so he started his career and he said, I want to write and make 10 movies. Yeah. Um, so he has now done that. So he is writing and he's going to, st he's starting to cast his 10th movie right now, uh, The Film Critic. And of course, like Brad Pitt and like oh, yeah. and Tom Cruise. You know what? Has he worked with those guys before? Yes. Well, there you go. He's working with the same actors. Yeah. But I want to see. I this is what I want to see. I want to see Quentin Tarantino. Please, please. I want to see Quentin Tarantino cast all of his actors for his last movie who have never worked before. I wanted. The, I w I would love to see them all be debut actors. And then I want to see like what Tarantino can bring from those actors in those performances. I would love it if his last feature film that he makes is all actors in their first time roles. I think that would be such a tribute to the industry. Well, that's not happening. Well, I, probably not. <laughs> but people would still go see it. No, it, it, Quentin could cast and shoot a film with no names, mm -hmm. no names, and nobody, even non-SAG actors. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he can make a quality film. A definite quality film. And again, it it, it all starts with the storyline. Quentin's got this, you know, marvelous way to tell stories. Mm -hmm. Um Marjorie De Hay, I keep bringing her up, but she she is she's the hidden gold of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. She's got a law degree, she's got a business degree, she's got a writing certificate uh, for cinema from UCLA. She writes, mm -hmm. she writes fast, and she writes a solid piece of script whether you know we've had to change it to accommodate what we can do mm -hmm. you know the only failure on our scripts are our abilities to bring forth what we have um meaning marjorie's coming on here in about two weeks by the way very nice uh it's up one very uh, what kind of that's it's you know something to suggest to ask her i'll tell you off screen oh uh, yeah we'll talk about off screen but, but yeah. she's she's a bond girl mm -hmm. she's a bond girl all right, maybe she wasn't in a Bond movie, but she 
she had something to do with James Bond. And that's all you got to say. That's all I'm going to say. Because, again, I'm not sure of non-disclosures if she wants to talk about that. So it's like yeah, it, we went to high school together. Mm-hmm. And it's like that's – that's um, you got to have to – you got to like the people you work with. Mm-hmm. So it's like I, I'm not saying Rochester is this weird place where it's like you only, you know, have this certain personality that works with certain personalities. It's not. I have this um, – it's not like I was best friends with her, you know, in high school by any means. But it's like there's this um, – mesh of communication it, it fails only on my part she, again she's at a playing field higher than me she's very creative she's smart and she knows what the fuck she's doing um i i could i'd gladly say i'm riding her coattails because she's that good but it's like what we do together is because of my background in physical production and her experience and knowledge of the other side of the industry coming together, we were just a perfect match. Well, that's such an important part of like filmmaking is finding people where your skills don't overlap yeah. and, and where everyone kind of helps out where other people don't have expertise. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, again, just the, we make a perfect pair by just complimenting each other on what we can do. Beautiful. So. Beautiful. So what do you have coming in 2024 that we need to keep an eye out, eye out for? I, I'm, we're really pushing forward to shoot another film this summer. Um, you know, the idea was to be able to uh, shoot something. It, we One, it has to come with a script. So we we don't have the script yet. But, uh, you know, if we do get the script on time, we are shooting this summer. Um, this With IATSE possibly going on strike, I, I think it, a lot of films might be, you know, delayed again. So, I mean, it's a different type of strike than the writers and the actors, but... Uh, what What's this coming up? Uh, the IATSE's in negotiation with the uh, MP... The... Uh, with the MPTP... I'm messing it up. But I don't even know. What what are these? What What, what is the IATSE? The, 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 the state... Oh, it's not state chance. It's, um, it's the... The... Production crews? Don't... Don't butcher me for this, but uh, it's a uh, the God. This is an acronym, and you know, put me on the spot. I can't do it, but it's 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 the unions. Mm-hmm. So uh, God, it's in production, yeah. editors, the camera, cinematographers, uh, stagehands. So there's like 11, 13 locals, I think, negotiating as as one as I, one IATSE. So it's like I'm a member of Local Seven Hundred, which is the Editors Guild. Um, technical directors are in that. Um, but I could have been just as easily um, when the technical directors became part of IATSE, I could have been in 700 just as well, the camera local, because we work, technical directors work with camera guys more. So you're saying there could be a strike this summer also? There could be. I mean, they're negotiating right now. I, I just saw a post that they came out of negotiation the first day where they're putting forth to the producers um, that they're negotiating with what we want so um i could tell you I, I know they said they're asking for a lot but whatever they're asking for it's not enough it's never enough and you you go in there with your your the plate of what you want to get and then you start picking away at like what you're willing to give up yeah so it's like you got to go in there it's like last i was part of the last i wasn't part of the last i was on the board of directors where i would see during the last two negotiations and being in the editors guild, technical directors are such a small uh, focus. It's like it, the overall going into negotiations is protecting the majority of its members, and the majority of the members are editors, your sound editors, uh, assistant editors, um, sound effects editors, editors, mm-hmm. um, and technical directors um, fall into a less than two hundred members of an eight thousand member guild so um and my whole thought process every time they went in there is like they did not ask for enough they're like they were giving stuff up that they could have asked for and it's like they were going for things that really affected all the the editors about um like you know i don't want to get into the details because i'll i'll mess it up i'm, I'm not that it's okay but it's, there's there's a strike coming yeah i no, i'm not saying there's a strike coming yeah uh, because after the last two strikes, that put everything in a delay. It's like the 
productions have not come back to what they should be right now. That's very clear. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, a lot of my work is not in film, but it's like I see that have, it affects me and what I've been doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, to have another strike would be almost devastating. Nobody wants to strike, but, you know, it's like struggling to survive in this town when you're looking at the CEOs of these companies making a half a billion dollars a year salary fuck so as like not not really a level playing field no no it's not so it's like the the middle class is dying it's like we can talk about economy and whatever and you know again everything i say is all hearsay and i'll butcher any details i will definitely butcher and get wrong and somebody will criticize me and well, conspiracy theories work yeah. on this podcast so yeah. no stress at all so uh david zabloff is a uh, alien and they just haven't released the information yet. That UFO information they were talking about in Congress came in on that first ship. <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's a... All right. So um, anything else you need, want to talk about for this year or no. coming up soon? Hey, listen. So it's. I was going to say, if I can say one thing, you know, it's, it's to support an independent filmmaker like myself or anybody who's in the industry who's making a movie, the best thing you can do is see their film, make a... You give it a thumbs up or give it a rating. Rate it how you think. You know, it's like if you're looking at my film, Bottle Monster or Mortal Thieves, and you're comparing it to, say, Titanic, which had a billion dollar, you know, funding, you know, yeah, you'll give me a one star. But if you compare me to what we did with nothing and the Titanic, who had everything, mm-hmm. you know, it's like it's, it's comparing apples and oranges. So it's like you got to understand where they came from, what they were doing. So, you know, be a little less harsh on independent filmmakers. And it's like, if you encourage them, they will make better films. That's that's what I want to say. You can watch any director's first film and see their second film, how they did better, and then the third film, how it gets better. And it's like, it's there's an element to improvement most people's films. Not to say that a film won't bash or die or, you know, not do well. But you'll see the directors, the cinematographers, you know, growth as a filmmaker in any production. Mm. So it's it's a beautiful progression to watch. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean even like uh, Quentin Tarantino and, and he had some great helping. You know, obviously he put himself through his own mental film school at the video shop, but it's like he was he was at the Sundance of filmmakers you know, how to make a movie kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I love Wes Anderson. Yeah. I love Wes Anderson. So, yeah. I mean it's like and it's having that unique voice and but being our our one of our detriments to the filmmaking process is we never gave ourselves enough pre-production time. It's like, hey, we're doing a film. Get that script. Get the script done. The script is done. Okay. Marjorie wrote The Mortal Thieves 22 times. So it, it's a lot of rewrites throughout the whole thing. But as soon as we knew we had a great script, let's start the production process. So it's like within a, a month of pre-production time, which is not a long time for pre-production, mm-hmm. we jumped into this film. So would it help to have a longer pre-production? Yeah. But, you know, it's like, could we afford to have a longer pre-production? No. Mm-hmm. It's like we jumped into it. It's, that's the thing. You just do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Guerrilla filmmaking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I worked on Dr. Phil for so long, he's got so many stupid comments, but I got one of my own. <laughs> you know, you jump in head first, eventually you'll get your feet wet. <laughs> At some stage. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'm going to show you my uh, camera switching skills here. All right. So we're going to go four to the wide, and we can shake it out. All right, man. Excellent. Really good to meet you. Pleasure. Thank you so much.